Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order the Village of Westmont Planning and Zoning for Wednesday, December 13th. It's 7.01, so we are a minute behind already. And uh, I will ask the uh, Secretary to call the roll, please. Commissioner Carmichael. Here. Commissioner Sharp. Here. Commissioner Van Buren is here. Commissioner Thomas. Here. Commissioner Bartel. Here. Commissioner Lavoie. Here. And Chairman Pill. Here. We have a quorum. We have a quorum. Please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before you sit down, uh, those of you who are going to give testimony, either for or against, I need to swear you in. So if you would just raise your right hand and uh, just uh, acknowledge what's a simple I do. Do you swear that your testimony will be truthful, so help your God? I do. Thank you and be seated. And I would ask also that you please silence or turn off any kind of pagers, cell phones, any electronic devices that could disturb the sanctity of our meeting. Thank you. All righty. I see we have a lot of returning faces, and so you know our policy is that before you uh, speak at the podium, there is a sign-in sheet up here. There's also one out in the hall. Many of you have already signed in. That's great. But you will need to sign in when you approach the podium uh, to go ahead and uh, offer testimony. Our first order of business tonight is the approval of the minutes of the November 8, 2017 regular meeting. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Thomas, second by Commissioner Bartell. Comments, questions, or discussion on the minutes? Hearing none, roll call, please. Commissioner Sharp? Yes. Commissioner Van Buren votes yes. Commissioner Thomas? Yes. Commissioner Bartell? Yes. Commissioner Lavoy? Yes. Commissioner Carmichael? Yes. Chairman Pill? Yes. Is there anyone who is here tonight to speak on something that is not on our current agenda? Thank you. We'll review the public hearing procedures. Those of you who were here last time, it will remain the same. Meeting has already been called to order. We'll then go ahead and I will introduce each item on the agenda in the order they're listed. We only have two items tonight. Please approach the speaking area and sign in concurrently. We invite the presenting team or individuals to present the agenda item, explaining their item, addressing the findings of fact, and any hardships as relevant. There's also an overhead projector there that's controlled by our video room, and they will go ahead and take care of uh, getting the diagrams. We do have an audience at home. I ask everyone to face the front so that you're addressing the commission, and the diagrams will show up on the two TV monitors as well as those at home. Uh, I'll then have staff offer comments. After that, we'll open the public hearing, or in this case, we'll continue to re excuse me, reopen the public hearing. Everyone will have a chance to speak. I might add that as this is a continuation, we're here mainly addressing specific items that the commission brought up in response to items that the general public brought up. And so we're not going to go through every single item that we had before. So we'll be looking for new thoughts, new ideas, or things that have come or become more relevant in the last 30-day period since we last met. After the public hearing, each commissioner will offer comments and question the applicants and or the staff. There'll be a discussion among the commissioners, and at the conclusion of the discussion, if a variance or special use is requested, we'll have the findings of fact read into the record. There'll then be a vote with a motion and a second roll call for each item listed, and finally, the applicant will be instructed on the next steps. So, with those as our, uh, as our guideline, we will begin with old business, and we'll start with planning and zoning item 17-023, the approval of the findings of fact from the November 8th, 2017 public hearing regarding the property located at 410 North Washington Street, the North Lot in Westmont. For those of you uh, who aren't aware of this, we uh, did not have our findings of fact ready last uh, month, and so this is just finishing up the first agenda item from last month. So if I could have the reading of the findings of fact for PZ 17-023, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. PZ 17-023 for James Lesko regarding 410 North Washington Street, the North Lot in Westmont. 
Request for a variance for relief from the maximum or minimum lot width requirement for a dwelling in the R3 single family detached residence district. Criteria number one, the property in question cannot yield a reasonable return if permitted to be used only under the conditions allowed by the regulations in the district in which it is located. Findings of fact, the applicant is a, propo a proposed purchaser who did not create this lot with substandard lot width. The lot is under separate ownership from adjacent lots and the applicant is unable to purchase additional land to rectify this nonconformity. Without this variance, the property is completely unbuildable and the applicant cannot yield a reasonable return. Criteria number two, the plight of the owner is due to unique circumstances. Findings of fact, the applicant did not subdivide this lot to create this nonconforming lot width, and the applicant has no ability to purchase property to make this lot wider. However, the applicant has designed a new house which meets all of the bulk requirements, setbacks, lot coverage, etc., of the zoning ordinance. Criteria number three, the variation if granted will not alter the essential character of the locality. Findings of fact, the applicant has designed a new house for the property which fits well in the lot and is comparable <coughs> to surrounding houses in the immediate area. The new proposed house complies with all setbacks and lot coverage restrictions and is setback sufficiently from the house to the immediate south which contains a one foot side yard setback. The substandard lot is not expected to create adverse storm water or other adverse impacts on the neighborhood. If you agree with these findings of fact, please raise your hand. If you don't agree. Sorry, I didn't raise my hand to say I did. Okay, let's try that again. If you agree with these findings of fact, let's raise your hands. Ah, we now have seven hands up. We are unanimous with an approval. The findings of fact for planning and zoning on MPZ 17-023 are complete and passed. Continuing on with old business, planning and zoning item 17-024, PHOBH, Hotel Owner, LLC, and WCW Landowner, LLC, regarding the property located at 3500 Midwest Road, Oak Brook, Illinois, for the following. Do these all need to be written since we're reopening? All need to be read? No, you, you don't have to read them all. Okay. So this is, uh, I will now reopen the public hearing on this that was continued. Everybody who has a copy of the agenda has the items A through J. They remain the same, so we will not uh, spend the time reading those in. And uh, I will open up the podium first for the uh, representatives from the HARP Group. Good evening and thank you. Good evening. My name is Dan Shapiro. My office is in Northbrook, Illinois. Mr. Chairman, thank you for hearing us tonight. Uh, with me is our team. Uh, we've had our team here before. And thank you for reminding us that this is part two and we're going to try to concentrate tonight on what's new or how we're responding to some of the concerns that we heard last time, both from the public and, and from this body. Um, as, as I recall, many of the concerns had to do with uh, landscaping, some architectural and some stormwater. So with your permission, we'd like to focus in on that. Uh, the essence of the, of the development is the same. Our, requested relief from, from zoning and from legal perspective is the same, except for some minor tweaks. Um, there was a uh, suggestion by staff uh, that we amend our text amendment request to the B3 special business district to no longer add new language after what you saw was the deleted language. Uh, and we've uh, looked at that and we agree with staff's recommendation. So we're on the same page there. Um, we are very close with respect to uh, some transactional documents with, with the park district, a conveyance document, we'll call that a purchase and sale agreement, as well as a lease. Uh, we're, we're about this close and we met most recently yesterday to, to work these items out. We're, we're very optimistic and I told them I was going to tell you that we're very optimistic and we, we expect to finalize these documents in short order. And they said that's, that's accurate. So we, we are working on that. We've also been working with staff and particularly uh, Mr. Zemanek on a restrictive covenant as we talked about last time to restrict certain uses of the, we'll call it the front nine, uh, that would be the portion that we would be conveying to the park district and then leasing back. And so we've been working with, with John and staff on uh, restricted uses going forward on the front nine so to balance the use as open space golf with some of the neighbors nearby. Um, make sure that they're not um, disturbed by any any activities. We're also working uh, diligently um, with with Mr. Zemanek on a development agreement, which we will have ready um, should this matter go to the board on the 21st. 
Um, pursuant to, the, to this commission's and staff's request, we've also identified a conservation easement for the, the Grove area as you enter into the development, and that is identified on our proposed uh, plat of subdivision. And with that in mind, we've, we've also shifted the plat a little bit to include a detention pond uh, with the hotel lot. Uh, after talking about that with staff as well. So from a legal perspective, we've been a little busy, but I think we've made a lot of progress. From a site planning, architectural, and engineering perspective, I'll now turn it over to uh, Rick Faywell. How do I fire this up? Did you load it up? No. I thought you guys did. No. I have the jump drive. You should be able to. <laughs> Uh, my name is Rick Faywell. I'm with the architecture firm of Wright Harima Architects. We've been working on the master plan with the entire team. I think you're all somewhat familiar. Um, anyway, um, I'll walk you through. First of all, you're familiar with the project team, Peter Dumont, the Harp Group, Dan Shapiro, myself with Wright Herma. Um, Marianne's here from the Kaufman Family Foundation. Uh, ben Busman, our civil engineer, will talk about the civil issues of stormwater. David McCallum on landscape, if you have any questions. And Louie Abona is here from KLA to talk about parking. I think Dan's already talked about the entitlements. Um, and you've seen the, you know, the current zoning and what we're proposing for the B3 district and the B3 PD special use. I think it's been discussed, the parking, but just to reiterate, um, we're more or less taking the site, and I'm gonna move to the site plan, it's easier to see. More or less, this is the master plan. We're taking that master plan and making the parking field much more efficient, so it goes from 965 cars to 1143. Uh, which virtually accommodates everything, not only with the hotel conference center, but also the natatorium. We're about 102 spaces short, and as you'll see later on, the diagram with valet allows us to pick up that 102 spaces. So even without the apartment uh, parking garage, we'll be able to meet the requirements for both the hotel conference center and the natatorium. Um, and this is that site plan with a the diagram at the bottom. I realize you can't read it, but at this point, I think it's in your packet and you're all familiar with the parking numbers. In the end, we'll be 186 parking spaces over the requirement once the garage is built for the natatorium. Um, I think the biggest thing that's changed in terms of the site plan is the, some of the parcels, for instance, the hotel, um, the hotel conference center parcel now includes the, the pond south of the hotel. For stormwater reasons, for reasons of uh, folks requiring or requesting, not only with the village but elsewhere, that the hotel owner be able to take responsibility for the maintenance of that pond, stormwater, into the future for the entire site, which is also the desire of the hotel owner. And in so doing that, you know, it improved the overall FAR and, and open space requirements. I think the other thing that's notable that's happened in the site plan is the Oak Grove now despite Jill wanting to keep it as, as it was, we've actually made it a conservation easement. So in, in the future, that will always be protected. That's the Oak Grove right at the main entry. This is the proposed traffic plan. I think, again, you've seen it, but just to reiterate, not much has really changed overall in terms of the total traffic volume. In other words, from day one, well over a year ago, the apartment and the natatorium 
we're providing additional traffic. That's in the traffic study, which was created by uh, KLOA and uh, run past the DuPage County, I think a year ago. Virtually nothing has changed except for the location. So anything that's changed with traffic has to do with on-site traffic. So this diagram walks you through how that traffic diagram works on site. Likewise, we've put together uh, a special diagram just for the proposed pedestrian walkways. That issue comes up periodically. And just to be clear, there are sidewalks all along Cass, Midwest, and, and into the site so that people can walk around and they're interconnected between all the different uses. So that allows people to use it for walking, walking dogs, jogging, any, any recreational purposes. So that diagram is, is, I think, relatively new. We also were asked last time to make sure that all the circulation work for emergency egress and large truck access. So this diagram addresses that um, so that you can see the turning radii for all the fire truck movements around all the buildings, natatorium, the apartment, as well as hotel and conference center. And as I said, this is the new sort of request for uh, changing the B3 portions of the site. This, this diagram just zooms in and talks specifically about that area, the, the existing uh, tree oak grove to remain approximately 5.15 acres. So that now will be, have a conservation easement. And the overall parking, uh, like I say, went to 1,143 spaces from 965 simply by creating something that's much more efficient at the same time providing handicapped parking access that doesn't require people to roll through lots and things. So the handicap access for both, for all buildings has vastly improved. Uh, you'd ask for a photometric study. I realize you can't read the numbers on this photometric study. You can if you zoom in, if you have it on your, on your computer and you enlarge it. But suffice it to say that the average is over uh, 0.5 uh, foot candles average across the parking lot with a maximum of around 4.6 and minimum of course zero uh, and zero is at more or less at the lot line so these are going to be a minimum number of fixtures uh, it meets the IESNA requirements for lighting in a parking lot and at the same time they're sharp cutoff fixtures so it doesn't add to light pollution in the atmosphere nor does it dribble over into the border of, of our uh, the road Willowcrest or uh, the neighbors and, and on this sheet as well, we have the cut, off, the cut fixtures, the samples of the fixtures we're talking about. Now, of course, around the, uh, the uh, apartments, we'll have lower bollards. Again, sharp cut off, so you won't, you, won't be, uh, you won't see it. This is that valet diagram I talked about, where, wherein before the apartments are built with the additional parking in the garage, we'll be able to realize an additional 102 spaces simply by valet parking the shaded portion of the, of the garage, of the parking lot, sorry. And then this is the site specific to the natatorium uh, with sort of a paved area. A lot of this paving is gonna be permeable pavers uh, in that plaza in front of the natatorium as well as all of the pavers around the natatorium for emergency egress and service access. And this is again that diagram that shows you the pond to the south of the hotel that is now part of the plat, ultimately will be part of the, the plat that will be just the hotel conference center parking lots. In other words, not the natatorium, not the apartments, not the R1, and not the uh, remaining nine holes of golf. I don't need to necessarily walk through the the natatorium in any detail, but suffice it to say, it's a destination for swimmers, those desiring learn how to swim. It'll become a community amenity in many ways. Um, it'll also be open for classes of all different types, and also, um, obviously, Olympic training, the, the large pool, which is 50 meter long course. It will be an ideal Olympic training facility, as well as uh, be able to have the ability to hold all different types of meets, short course, long course, 25 yards, 50 meters, uh, it's going to be a fabulous facility. And as we mentioned before, we'll, we'll really put Westmont on the map and in the region, the state, and, and the nation, and internationally as well. These are the renderings of the natatorium. I think you've seen it, seen it before. And the plans we included in the packet as well. There's one level below grade where there's a minimal amount of, of underground uh, service. 
the main deck of the pool itself, the two pools, I should say, and locker rooms, and then 1,200 seat bleacher that wraps around on three sides as well as some other amenity and uh, use space on the second level, so-called mezzanine. I think you've seen the elevations. It's predominantly precast tilt up with a clear story band around the entire portion of the building that's call wall. In other words, translucent panels that'll light, let light in. And there's uh, also windows in various places on all the different elevations. That's been adjusted now with a new location, I should mention. This is a section I think folks were interested in last time. Besides looking at the signs that are drawn here, yeah. uh, the section shows the height of the natatorium, 42 feet 9 inches, uh, the service road, the landscape next to the building, landscape adjacent to now a retaining wall is 5 feet tall per your code, and then the berm, landscape berm facing the residents uh, to the east. That landscape berm, even though our lovely section here is a little bit skimpy, if you look at the landscape plans is actually uh, very thick and has a variety from low level, mid level, and finally taller level trees to screen the building um, and provide sort of a landscape buffer between the residence and the natatorium. In addition, as you're aware, the ballroom, um, there's an additional building there to replace the tent, same function, more or less ballroom for uh, tied into the ballroom level of the conference center as well as Golf, court golf cart storage underneath the ballroom and a mechanical room so that it does a number of things. Gets rid of the tents, puts a hard wall around the ballroom, and then puts golf carts which were previously sitting outside along the edge of the, along the eastern edge near the residence inside a building and a structure. Simple elevations and section of the, that addition onto the hotel. And then finally the apartments and uh, if you don't mind, <clears throat> um, I'll walk through this in a wee bit more detail um, because there's been concern and, and folks are interested. Th these are updated renderings that we did in the subsequent to the last meeting. It just gives you a better idea what the architecture is going to feel like. Uh, specifically, Commissioner Lavoie had asked for some details and some information. So we have uh, material boards or material panels and samples of glass so that you get a better understanding. But the, uh, the renderings also help you understand as well. But this is the site plan. The building is essentially nestled in behind the trees along Cass and Midwest, um, adjacent to the west parking lot, uh, looking at the very north end of that, at the west nine holes of golf. Setback is 50 feet as is required and 150 feet from the R1 district as required. Nothing too terribly unique about that. Uh, because the site slopes as it heads east, or sorry, as it heads west, uh, we're taking advantage of that with the amenity level being tucked down in more or less, not a basement level, but a lower level relative to the eastern end of the building. The parking also slopes. You'll see that in a section later on. But this is the amenity level that has everything for the residents, multi-purpose rooms, meeting rooms, business area, bike kitchen, uh, fitness center, uh, yoga rooms, a great room. Uh, you know, places that, that residents can go and hang out, more or less like their own living and social space, meet other residents, adjacent to outdoor space that is uh, meant for the residents to use, a pool with cabanas, bar, um, to really s foster as much social activity and, and uh, exterior use of the, the space around the building facing on, on the south in particular. This is the level that's uh, the main entry level, and it's, it's, it's got the main entry level to your, as you're looking at it, to your left, as well as the garage entry to your right, and we can talk about that in more detail. I think last time questions were raised about the trash and things like that, we can go into more detail, but essentially there's a trash room on each floor. It's collected on the ground floor, wheeled out, and, and coordinated when trash pickup comes and picked up outside, taken away. Move, moving in and out happens either in the building, uh, if, the, if the vehicles are small enough, uh, which is what's you know, largely encouraged, or if, if there happens to be a situation where somebody shows up with a, a larger van then that would be stationed along um, this sort of lay-by lane. The typical floor plan uh, looks very much like the first floor except with the exception of the entry points. 
The units wrap around, as you know, uh, the, the garage, allowing residents to park, who live on each floor, to park on the same floor, making it as convenient and, as possible. And finally, there's um, mechanical on the roof, screened with a green roof. Um, we've talked about the fact that the building will be uh, LEED certified when it's finally complete. And I think we'd also mentioned before the luxury multifamily development transportation amenities. In other words, complete shuttle, shuttle service similar to what the hotel currently has just tagging on to that. I think Peter's uh, talked about adding additional uh, sprinter vans to allow people to go anywhere, anytime, at 24 hours a day. Zip cars so that people don't have to own a car. They can, you know, essentially use a zip car whenever they feel like they need a car. If you have a car that's electric, electric charging stations, There'll be 24-hour on-site maintenance and door person, so for security, so from a security standpoint, there'll always be somebody there, and there'll be maintenance on the entire site, the hotel, uh, as well as the apartments. And then the typical units look something like this. Again, I think you've seen it all. The one bedrooms are roughly around 680. The um, two bedrooms run between 1,000 and 1,200, depending on the type <coughs> of units. Some have a den office space. So there's a little bit of variety in the two bedrooms. And I don't think we had included it last time, but we thought we'd include the elevations. There's really, it's not anywhere near as interesting to look at as the renderings because for the most part, it's an unnatural view looking straight on at the face of the building. You almost never, never do it. Um, but we included the elevations. And then a section as well, as I mentioned before, that garage dips down where the land actually drops as it heads west. Took advantage of that for a lower level of parking. And then of course, we're parking on the roof. so. Technically, there's nine levels of parking, seven levels of apartments, to be clear. And later on, we'll also address the fact that somebody was asking about the heights of all the different things, not only the apartments, but the, the hotel. So we have a uh, diagram to talk about that. Um, this was uh, created to address Commissioner Lavoie's concerns about, uh, you know, what does it look like? What are the details? Uh, so we've got sort of, you know, uh, enlarged views of the windows and how it, it migrates into the wall system, the balconies, uh, the actual construction of the wall thickness, the insulation. Um, we brought we brought sort of a, a mock-up, if you will, uh, of the <coughs> system that's going to be in the exterior. And this has to be ceram ceramics. It's okay, like a porcelain. Can you, know, you go back to, to the microphone oh, to talk, sorry. though? Yeah, I'll pass it around. We lose, uh, we lose you then. Yep, sorry. I can talk <clears throat> there's, there's people hinged on every, yes. your every word. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's sad, but okay. Um, <laughs> so we're passing around the, the samples of what the exterior wall makeup will be. Here you have the details on the drawings, um, everything from the balcony, which is important for uh, amenity in this, in this particular. Uh, apartment type complex. And then uh, these are the updated renderings, which I think you all have. You know, it's always hard to look at these on, on screens. And so, you know, I'd love to have big panels that I could show you, but, you know, that would be tough to bring out. And, uh, but this gives you an idea from the moment you drive up to the apartments. This is the, the first view you see <coughs> as you turn right off of off the main drive and you're heading towards the apartments. This is that uh, eastern elevation, if you will. And then as you round the corner and uh, head to the drop-off, this is the view you'll see at the main drop-off for, for the apartments. Uh, there's a big drop-off circle. There's plenty of space for cars. Um, you know, there's guest parking in this, right off of this as well. So it's easy for any number of people to come drop off, pick up, whatever, uh, at the apartments. And, and you can see, too, in the background, the trees, that's, that's along Cass Avenue. So we're, like I say, nestled within, behind the trees along Cass Avenue, uh, screening it from the view of Cass Avenue, but also for the benefit of the residents, they, we don't want to have them have to look out on, onto a busy street. This is a more close-up detail of the Port Cochere at the main entry, mm -hmm. just again because you asked. Um, so it's pretty straightforward, simple, uh, calls attention to this is the main entry. It's a, Simple glass uh, court cochere, so it allows light. It's not dark, but it provides shelter for anybody who's waiting outside in the rain. And this is the view. This is now the uh, west elevation 
This is the view looking down on that exterior space and the lower level amenities. So you see in the courtyard, besides the fact that it ties in with the amenities inside, the exterior space has sheltered space for barbecue, outdoor fire pits, tables and chairs, uh, Tivoli lighting, so that it always feels special and uh, can be lit at night so people can see uh, without, uh, you know, because it's so cloistered in that little courtyard without too much light pollution. And then it wraps around to the southern side, which is, of course, the location for the pool and uh, all the other amenities, the bar, uh, additional barbecue and fire pits to encourage, again, as much social interaction activity as possible around the pool and uh, interactive with the interior. And then this is that overall south elevation uh, from the golf course looking at the apartment building with the amenities at the ground floor. And you can see how the land slopes down. Um, and you can also see around that curve to the left how Cass Avenue is screened uh, with the landscape. That's already there, by the way, most of it. And then we're adding to it, again, per the request of uh, commissioners here last time. So I've already talked about the outdoor amenities, but um, I've already talked about <laughs> nothing else to say. Um, lifestyle amenities, this really talks more about the interiors. You know, top of the line finish is a great room with games, bar, viewing room and living room, a business center, fitness center, multi-purpose room, <coughs> theater. Uh, you know, as many things as we can provide amenities for that will help attract people and make this a memorable experience in a great social interactive space. I think you've seen the renderings of the great room before, the bar in the background, TVs, lounging places, fireplace. Uh, the idea is to make it look as five-star hotel experience as possible because that's the kind of people we're attracting. Uh, the fitness center uh, has got to be state-of-the-art and will be. Um, and then the apartments, uh, this is sort of looking at the open area of and they're very much loft style in nature, kitchen, dining, and living room in the background, the bedrooms. Uh, again, um, And then I think one of the things everybody's most curious about, and we talked about it briefly, but probably didn't cover it in enough detail, but you know, the aerial views and the views from pedestrian level of the apartments. This is the aerial view looking east, or actually southeast, <coughs> if you will. And then you can see around it, there are a, no, a number of arrows where we're, we'll, we'll be showing you the views from those locations. So you can get an idea of exactly how much of the apartment you're going to see from outside. This is looking south. Um, you know, so it's the north elevation. Again, you can see even in an aerial view where we're rising up tall enough to look at it, uh, a lot of it is screened by the trees. And then finally, looking southwest, um, more or less as, as if you were on Midwest but backed up and, and uh, hopped on a drone and flew into the sky. So this is the first view, which is really right at the intersection of Midwest, Cass, and uh, Willowcrest. And you can see the planned view on the upper left-hand corner. That's as if you were standing at that location. What you see today is in the upper right-hand corner. What you'll see in the future with a proposed seven-story apartment building is what you see on the lower level. In this view, it, it happens because those trees are so big and you're close enough that they're per, pretty much completely screened. The apartment is completely screened. The second view, uh, which is from Cass Avenue, on the other side of Cass Avenue, so farther away, which allows the uh, apartments to be a little bit better seen. Again, you can see the view in plan up to the upper, upper left. The upper right is the view as you see it today. And then this is the view as you will see it ultimately once the, once the apartments are built. So they, they will pop up above that landscape. Uh, we can do more in terms of screening it, but for the most part, that's landscape and trees that are already there right now. This is the uh, third view and again you can see in plan where it's taken from from that drop-off circle or a roundabout on the other side of, of the curve on Cass Avenue. Uh, and again you can see it in the plan, the location, you can see what it looks like today in the upper right and what it'll look like once the apartments are built. So you'll see it because you're relatively close and that planting at that point is relatively uh, thin today, um, but that, that gives you an idea of the scale and what you'll see. This is the view. It's the fourth view. This is a little bit farther back. You're on Midwest Road now, coming around the curve. This is what you'll see. Again, largely trees right now, and then ultimately this is the view you'll see 
largely screened again by the trees. Those oak trees are, are pretty good size. If you then go to Oakley and Cass, this is the fifth view. I'm sorry, I don't have a map of it, but you can, uh, I think you're pretty much familiar. You're on the other side of Cass Avenue now, so it's, it's in one sense more visible. On the other hand, there's more planting in the foreground on this side of Cass Avenue that will start to screen. As you're standing closer to it, it'll, it'll actually screen it even more than if you're on the sidewalk. And then if you're on Cass Avenue uh, on the other side of the street, on the eastern side of the street in a car, you're again closer to the landscape so it screens the building uh, like this. And then if I think somebody had asked us for a view from Trinity Lane, this is the seventh view, more or less there's, there's no way you can see the apartments from, from that vantage point. This diagram I think is the one we showed last time. You can see that Cass Avenue is, you know, starts at 745 at the entry to uh, the hotel rises to 750 and 755. The building uh, first floor is at 770. The uh, court and the uh, courtyard and the pool are at 755 on those sort of western pieces where it, where it drops down. But the, um, the main part of the first floor is at 770 and then it rises 77 feet with the seven floors at 11 feet floor to floor. So this was the diagram we put together based on the request to uh, give us an idea as to what it looks like relative to the hotel and, and a little bit more of the site. You can see that as you come up uh, the main entry drive, come to the hotel drop off, you rise up to 761. The top of the hotel is at 882. Top of the apartments, which was something that was asked for, is at 848. So you're approximately 34 feet shorter than the hotel with the top of the apartments. And then just to sort of, in scale, based on the plan you're looking at, this is just a projected scale. And you see at the bottom here the elevation from the south. It's, again, somewhat of an unnatural view. But it gives you an idea as to where the buildings sit on the, the site, because the sites vary in terms of topography, and where they sit relative to each other. So the apartments are up a little bit because the site's a little bit higher. The hotel on the back side is down a little bit. On the front side, it's, it's up. Uh, but I think you understand the overall idea. Again, this is nothing more than our lead checklist to say that we plan to have a lead certified building. And then I'm going to let uh, Ben Busman talk about uh, the preliminary civil engineering and uh, ultimately David McCollum to talk about the landscape. Good evening. Uh, ben Busman with Webster McGrath and Allberg. Uh, talk about the plats and the civil engineering. Got a dead pen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, since uh, the last meeting, uh, we've kind of clarified on this plan, the conservation easement located at the, as, as Rick has previously discussed, we've also increased the lot size for the natatorium to accommodate the uh, fire trucks wrapping around the building, uh, pr you know, provide a little extra lane width. We've also noted the um, revisions or the relocations of uh, the easements uh, for the sanitary and the water lines that are at, at that location. Um, bulk of our revisions are within the stormwater and the grading plan. Um, we've gone back through uh, and accommodated the new impervious areas, the detention required uh, for the north tributary area and the south tributary area. Um, I'm not sure what you're seeing on that screen and how this looks here, but the north, the north basin uh, requires about an extra third of an acre foot based on the new impervious area created as part of the parking lot expansion. The south basin south of the hotel requires about an extra two acre feet based on the new impervious area required by the village code. Now as, as part of what we're going to do as far as final engineering is we're going to study the entire system the entire golf course ponds and everything that leads us from here south to as it exits the property 
uh, at the south property line. Um, it would be a very detailed study reviewed by the village um, to make sure that we accommodate the stormwater management that's necessary. So. This is uh, simply an exhibit that shows the existing impervious areas, proposed impervious areas. This is the essentially the new impervious areas that generate what uh, what volume of detention we're required to provide for. This is kind of an aerial of the entire area showing where the water flows from us and from adjacent properties. Um, I think as I mentioned last week, we're kind of on the top of a hill here. There's a ridge line in the middle of the parking lot and uh, the north part of the parking lot drains north toward 35th Street. The uh, area south and around the hotel drains south all the way through the golf course and down to the south east corner of the golf course. I'll leave the rest for David. Good evening. My name is David McCallum. I'm the project landscape architect. Uh, based on comments that we received at the previous plan commission meeting and then subsequently uh, from staff reviews, their, uh, your consultants reviews and uh, a conversation with one of the neighbors and also meetings, uh, we've modified the landscape plan to address those items so what I'd like to do is just spend a moment to highlight those modifications that have been made. And if you have any specific questions on what we had looked at at our last meeting, I'll be happy to address those as well. At the previous meeting, uh, Commissioner Lavoie had asked that we provide some additional screening at the southwest area of the uh, proposed apartment building. Uh, on the previous plan, there was a large buffer, primarily of evergreen trees that ranged in height between 10 and 12 feet, and then also uh, shade trees and or ornamental trees, basically at that corner uh, between the property line and then moving in towards the site. This plan shows the addition of 21 uh, new shade, evergreen, and ornamental trees in that corner. You'll see a somewhat triangular shaped area, so that would be placed up a little bit higher than the uh, and the plants over in the corner you know, would provide some additional buffering. Staff had also made a recommendation as to the species and the sequencing of those species of the trees that are in the median on Cass Avenue, and that has been reflected on this plan as well. Uh, forestry has, had also made a recommendation as to the sequencing of the species of the parkway trees along Cass Avenue, and those has, has been, have been addressed uh, a recent review came out, I think, uh, at the end of last week for the area north of our entrance drive, and, and that will be addressed uh, as part of the final, final plan. As part of the stormwater management program, there's a new uh, detention basin, uh, basically at the north section of the property. You'll see somewhat of a triangular shape. Uh, that's now being planted with wetland uh, plugs, native plant materials, as part of the best management practice. The large parking lot area remains the same. Adjacent to the natatorium, there were several comments. One had to do with the berm to the east side. Uh, I had one conversation with a property owner who had made a recommendation that we uh, add a few shade trees to that berm area, and that has been done. Um, we've also extended the buffering south a little bit from what it was on the previous plan, so we now have some additional planting uh, that will provide more buffering at that southeast corner of the natatorium. There is also a request by staff to increase the area of the tree inventory to the area uh, adjacent to the south ponds. That has been done and it's part of your package. And then as part of the uh, larger scale stormwater management program, we've also added 
uh, native plantings of plugs within the detention basin as well. And that's the primary changes and modifications done to the landscape plan since our last meeting. Thank you. <coughs> All of us are certainly available for questions. There are just a couple comments I'd like to make before I turn it over. Um, <clears throat> we had uh, meetings with staff with respect to uh, off-site improvements, primarily landscaping and lighting along Cass Avenue. We've made those accommodations in the new plans. Uh, in addition to a dedicated 30-foot, 33-foot um, roadway dedication. In addition, there has been a lot of uh, discussion with regard to stormwater detention. I think we said this before, and, and we'll say it again. We are happy to collaborate with the village's engineer, certainly Ben, and some of the residents. I know they have uh, had an engineer uh, that look at this too, and we're happy and willing to collaborate to make it uh, you know, the best plan, put all great minds in the same room and come up with something. Thank you very much. Okay, I will uh, turn this over now for uh, staff comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I started with the much longer list, but the applicant has uh, addressed many of the items that I was going to cover, so I'll try not to duplicate, but I will highlight what I think are the more important issues. Um, first off, they touched off on item C, which is the, the requested text amendment to the B3 district. Um, previously, they had suggested some language that staff did not support staff. Um, uh, gave its own recommendation. Um, we are uh, in agreement now that they they are matching staff recommendations, so there there is no um, there is no disagreement there any longer. Um, they mentioned that the plat has changed. Um, that was derived off of staff comment, and the the primary issue with the change in the plat was that the detention pond that served the primary of the construction um, was on the golf course parcel, and in terms of uh, managing the um, um, on undertaking the maintenance of that property, we felt it should be uh, clear to the responsibility of Lot 1. So basically, Lot 1 increased in size, Lot 5, which was the golf course, decreased in size to make that accommodation for staff. Um, as they had discussed, um, previously they had not shown the requested right-of-way improvements, so your street trees along Cass Avenue and Midwest, Midwest Road are now there. Uh, lighting is now shown. Um, the uh, discussion on 35th Street was that a, the right-of-way dedication would be required and that has been accommodated. Um, the PD amendment has been submitted to uh, the village attorney um, to begin reviewing, um, whereas last time we had not had that going back and forth between the attorneys, so that has been provided. Um, there is uh, the discussion of the engineering. Last time, uh, staff engineers were not recommending that this uh, move forward at the time. Um, once I'm done, I will uh, let Mr. Noriega discuss the engineering and how it's been improved since that time. Um, the public land dedication was a point of discussion. I think it still is a point of discussion because it is still being worked out with the park district and the property owner. Staff's primary concern last time was um, if there was going to be a formalized parkland dedication that was not the front nine. It could um, make a change in the site plan. I don't think that is still at issue. I think what at issue is uh, it, it appears that the, the land will be um, somehow conveyed to the park district to satisfy their requirements, um, and it will not result most likely in a change in the site plan. I, so, so I think that's where the difference is there. So although I don't think staff has a, a determined answer because the agreement is still work, being worked out, the, the question of will it change the site plan, I, I don't think it will that, in staff's opinion. Finally, the, there, there's been several additional documents. So what staff did is based on commissioner inputs, um, the, the public's input, some of missing documents in the first round, um, staff basically translated that into some requirements, some recommendations, some, some things that we just felt that they should address in their, their, their topics tonight. Um, so that's why you do see things like the um, uh, truck turning diagram, the pedestrian pass, um, some of the other documents including the, um, the, the uh, photometric plan. Some things that sometimes come in in the permit stage and, and, um, and staff reviews them. We did get an advance on some of those. For example, the photometric plan staff has had a chance since the staff report was generated to look at those numbers. Um, they're not perfect, but I think they're within range that by the time it does come into permit stage, um, it will be easily remedied. Um, 
And as always, staff is available for any questions. Great, thank, thank you. you. Jill or Noriel? I, did you want me to kind of go over that stormwater management? Uh, the, I think the, that would be a good time to do that. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioners. So essentially at the last meeting, there was a number of uh, concerns brought up by neighboring subdivisions and residents about uh, where the, how this project might impact their stormwater concerns on their property. So essentially what I've actually included here, and I have some hand-drawn renderings, which I'll go through. Um, back in the 70s, 80s, when this was originally developed, much of what we have at list here in terms of storm water where their storm sewers go was looks incomplete but with the survey provided and connecting the dots we were actually able to review what they uh, where everything does go we had a general idea good idea where it, everything did flow but now with this in com combination with the DuPage County's GIS even uh, the village of Westmont's one foot contour map we have a very good idea where everything is now flowing so what you have in front of you is again the survey that was actually attached and what i ended up using from this survey is where the existing detention basins lie how they are connected by storm sewers and where they actually flow and connect into the village's storm sewer system so with that i ended up going into the county GIS system and with their technology they have a computer generated using the contours of what is actually provided they were able to look at and provide like the watershed divide as you've heard in their testimony and we will confirm that this is basically at the top of the watershed okay they're at the top of the hill so you'll see a dark and purple line which indicates where if you kind of think about if one raindrop were to hit the ground and not soak in but they were going to go overland flow you can kind of see that you know this is the top of the hill either if it fell north of this purple line it would actually travel in a northerly fashion versus if it fell in this other shaded area it would travel on its way down south so then i actually pieced another rendering together and which is their survey I know it's a bunch of lines, but you can see, again, my interpretation of where the watershed divide is. I highlighted where the detention facilities are. I connected their survey showing all in red, where it now shows all the storm sewer, so it shows the direction of such. I kind of gave general ideas where, you know, Saddlebrook, which is, you know, where my finger's pointing, is in the northeast direction, in the northwest direction here. Royal Hills Club, the Brook Hill Apartments, and Indian Trails. And again, that idea that if a raindrop were to fall in this particular area, which way and which direction it would actually fall. From here, then I again went into the DuPage County aerial uh, GIS system, showed those same, again, the detention, existing detention facilities, or some would call it a water hazard on the golf course, connected it all with the storm sewers and which way everything is actually flowing. So it gives you a little bit better idea. So now when you actually see and you hear testimony where a resident's concerned from Saddlebrook, how this development might actually impact them, you'll see that the raindrop that actually falls where the proposed apartment complex might be doesn't actually flow in that direction but flows in a southeast direction. And then even one step further, I just in general, not to scale in any way <coughs> manner, kind of indicated where the natatorium would be, the proposed apartments would be. Uh, in general, they're right now how they're modifying the detention faci facilities to meet the Westmont Code of or uh, Stormwater Ordinances and how their development is actually going to impact this area and actually be directed toward. <coughs> So with that, I hope that gives you a little bit better idea how things are flowing so that uh, it could help you make a better determination and 
Do you have any questions? I appreciate that. Thank you. Just Mr. one comment. Um, preliminary engineering has been submitted. Uh, I think there's a question as to the level of detail that's required by engineering staff when preliminary engineering is received and reviewed versus the process of going through final engineering and permitting and what the village's standard is for receiving preliminary engineering and saying, yes, we can recommend this on a preliminary basis. We think they can meet code moving forward. The engi preliminary engineering is what was submitted. I feel confident enough that we will be able to review in much more further detail uh, during the permit process. I don't see anything that would be significant in terms of where we would need, uh, let's just call it, uh, much more detail at this stage. Is this a typical level of detail we oftentimes get with a preliminary engineering yes. for a project of this scope? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to cover three topics that came up at the last meeting and that have come up since um, the last public hearing, uh, one being the traffic study. Uh, the revised traffic impact study was submitted to DuPage County. Uh, they're required to sign off on that because it's uh, DUDOT's right of way. Uh, Village engineer Norie Noriega and I met with DUDOT on Monday afternoon who discussed the project with us and stated that they still have some outstanding questions and concerns. Um, they were finalizing those with the applicant and as of 4, 4 p.m. today, uh, DUDOT emailed us to say that they have five additional comments that they would like addressed. Most of those had to do with questions regarding daily trips and peak events. Um, those will all be addressed or DuPage County won't issue the right-of-way permit. In addition to traffic, I've been working closely with DUDOT to make sure that we have an intergovernmental agreement in place for all the right-of-way improvements. Those include parkway trees, street lighting, and then the median landscaping. Um, with regard to lighting, um, just to give a brief overview, we measure light levels using the standard foot candles. And to give a general overview of that, moonlight can be less than what foot, one foot candle, whereas you could have 50 foot candles directly under uh, a pole light in a parking lot. There are various ways of regulating light, including having a maximum level, um, having an average, regulating different levels on the lot line, depending on your zoning district. Um, in our case, we require zero at the lot line and the photometric plan meets this in almost every instance. There are several places where it exceeds the code by about 0 0.2. Um, that will all be remedied by the time of final engineering. Uh, the lights are LED fixtures, they're recessed, and they're shielded when appropriate, which we would recommend. Um, and then finally, with regard to, we had some questions about tree preservation. Um, the final tree preservation plan will be in place prior to any permit issuance. Uh, the entire site was walked and inspected by the village forester. I personally reviewed every tree that was in the tree removal plan um, with input from myself, the village's landscape architect, and the village forester. Additional trees were requested to be saved that, we, that are typically closer than what would be desired to the building envelope. Uh, while we understand that some of the oaks are technically too close, we'd rather give the oaks a chance rather than removing them unnecessarily. Prior to construction, uh, the village forester will inspect the tree protection, will require root pruning and treatments when appropriate, and the developer is required to abide by our heritage tree ordinance, which will require substantial fees and or tree plantings if the oaks are impacted. Um, with all that being said, I also made it very clear during the last meeting that <coughs> I personally wouldn't recommend moving forward until the oak grove was protected by a permanent uh, easement, and that has not been shown on the uh, final or the preliminary subdivision plat and that will also be required for final great thank you thank you mr. Zemanek do you have any comments anything you'd like to add uh, I, the only thing I would add at this point is to echo what attorney Shapiro said about the negotiations with the park district uh, I did draft a restrictive covenant um, which has been shared with the park district mm -hmm. and the developer and their attorney uh, it's been negotiated what it provides is that the what's now the front nine of the golf course will um, be allowed to continue for golf course use. Um, they are planning to sell the front nine to the park district with a lease back that would allow the developer to continue to operate the golf course as a nine hole golf course moving forward according to the lease terms. Um, there is a buffer area that surrounds the existing residences of Oak Brook Hills. Um, that is the entire eastern portion of the golf course east of where the residents are and 100 feet to the immediate north and south of those residents. And as depicted on a map, uh, which I 
don't have because we're still negotiating this, but it does provide a uh, what I think we believe is a sufficient buffer area from any future uses. Uh, within the buffer area, the only things that are allowed would be golf, uh, hiking, walking, jogging, cross-country skiing trails, and minimal like directional signage or uh, tee box signage. Uh, and of course, ground security lighting. Uh, once the park district takes over ownership and operation of the property, once the lease terminates, uh, there is a list of permitted uses that we are negotiating that the park district can put the property to outside of the buffer area. It's traditional park uses such as playgrounds, picnic areas, um, active recreational space, passive open space, um, some minimal shelters. They do have the right to build a clubhouse on the nine hole course, assuming they don't have the right to use the clubhouse in the future. Uh, that's, I think, contained within the hotel property. Uh, some maintenance and equipment structures provided they serve that property and not any of the other park district properties, et cetera. That's still a negotiation. Um, I did get the authority of the park district attorney to finally share it with um, the residences of Oak Brook Hills attorney, which I did just late this afternoon. So they're taking a look at it, but uh, we're really close to having that finalized. And I think all parties agree the, re the restrictions are reasonable. If for some reason the negotiations with the park district and the developer fall apart and the park district and, and there's no conveyance to the park district, the land development code does state that um, the village can take existing open space uh, within a development and consider that or count that towards the park land dedication requirement. And if that were to happen, the developers willing to uh, essentially grant this same restrictive covenant over the front nine, saying it can only be used for golf course purposes or um, passive open space, which means it can't be used for anything else other than passive passive uses and and the village board can say that's sufficient for the parkland dedication one way or the other the golf course will be essentially preserved right thank you okay we're going to go to the public portion now and uh, I would ask everybody to uh, remember that uh, we have covered a lot of things in our uh, initial five hours um, so uh, this is sort of uh, part two and we'd like to hit some of the highlights of the things that were brought up tonight changes things that are new and uh, et cetera. And uh, we'll begin with any groups that are here represented by attorneys. And I think we'll have uh, attorney day up first. Good evening and thank you for coming back. Can't get enough, huh? Good evening. Um, I will keep this very brief. Uh, we previously submitted a memorandum dated November 8th. You still have a copy. I think uh, most of the items that are in that memo remain current, including my client's support for the project uh, and the approval of the planned unit development. You have a separate letter uh, dated uh, December 12th that was submitted to Chairman Pill. It addresses stormwater. There are deficiencies uh, that our engineer have uh, referenced in the stormwater. Uh, Bill Loftus is here. If you have questions regarding any of those, I don't need to elaborate beyond what is in the letter. Uh, I will say that we are, are uh, most appreciative that the developer has documented and again confirmed that collaboration in addressing stormwater and the final design for this project will be accommodated and we look forward to that process. Thank you very much. Another item uh, that we submitted has to do with the Park District. Uh, John did get me a copy of a draft the draft we've got is not final. I, I don't know exactly where that's going and I haven't had enough time. As it relates to the restrictive covenant and the park district negotiation and deal, I, I just can't speak to it. Uh, I can't speak for it. I can't speak against it. I just don't know enough at this stage. We've got a letter to that point. Um, Mary Ann Kaufman has worked extensively with our group as it relates to sound and lighting issues associated with the natatorium. Uh, that has been um, not minutes, it's been hours, uh, repeatedly over the course of many, many days. That collaboration and cooperation is appreciated. I want to express that on behalf of my client. We're here to answer any questions regarding the letter, but that's it for me.
Anyone else? All right. We'll go now to the uh, to the next to uh, any of our groups. Can I pass this to you, Joe? That's for the uh, public record. So I've got a lot of. I got three uh, documents off the public record. Can I ask, are, are these single copies that I should distribute, or are these um, multiple copies? Okay, now I've got something for distribute. Those, okay. those are just uh, the public record. Okay. That's my statement. So my name is Alan Corrin. I'm a Saddlebrook Community Association uh, board member, and I'm also a uh, member of the Committee for Responsible Development in Northwestmont. And I, I've been here before, I, as I recall. So I'm really pleased to be here. I'm uh, pleased to see uh, Chairman Pill and the commissioners and staff. This is a wonderful opportunity. It's a wonderful evening to uh, be with you at this time. Uh, I've got a written statement. But before I read this, Joe, can you help me out on one thing? Um, I, I just want to show one slide, and it was in the packet uh, that was just presented. Well, no, it wasn't just presented. It, so it, it was the it's a packet in, that's in the office that I saw. It's actually um, the tree inventory slide. It's the ones where the trees, uh, if the trees are going to be eliminated, or they're, they're crossed off. What was it? It's in there. Oh, I didn't see it. I didn't see it up there. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Okay, I'm going to try to present new information. So I think you all have the statement in front of me. So it's broken down into an introduction, uh, stormwater management, stormwater runoff management, trees, and then soil testing. Those, those those uh, typical uh, categories. My introduction is going to be brief, and then what I'd like to do is, um, you know, move, move to those categories. So, in my introduction, I say uh, we are concerned that the multiple proposed new developments at Oak Brook Hills will cause stormwater runoff, traffic congestion, and parking problems to our residential streets and neighborhoods. We also are concerned with protecting trees and especially the old growth oak forest at Oak Brook Hills. Finally, we are concerned with the possible soil pollution at the Oak Brook Hills golf course. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk about stormwater management, and, but I really want to focus on giving the commissioners a perspective on the, um, on the elevation of this bluff that, that the uh, the uh, Texas wraparound is, is located on. It's just a really, really tall bluff. And because it's a such, such a tall bluff, the Texas wrap, wraparound is going to be very high in, into uh, uh, visibility. Uh, and, uh, and it's going to be uh, you know, blocking a lot of, of uh, sunlight. So, so let me give, it, give that perspective. Uh, the development of the bluff area south of the entrance of Oprah Hills is a particular concern. The bluff area of the back nine is approximately 776 feet above sea level. Now, I'm gonna, I'll comment here. The uh, actual development is at 770 feet. We learned that today, so thank you. Um, this is the tallest point in Oprah Hills and the surrounding area. The bluff area is wooded and slopes mainly to the west the southwest and northwest. We understand that the trees to the north and west will be preserved, but then this area might not be suitable for either stormwater management remediation or soil remediation. The elevation at Cass Avenue adjacent to the bluff is approximately 746 feet or 30 feet lower. The back end of Royals Hills Club is 724 feet at the far west, west end. Saddlebrook is at is as low as 720 feet. Indian Trail to the west of the back nine is 754 feet to, in the front and 748 feet in the rear. 
Midwest Club is approximately at 750 feet. Trinity Lakes and Covington Court are at 740 feet and 730 feet, so we're going down. We estimate from the limited information that we have, because um, we didn't have a copy of, uh, of the new plans and uh, we didn't, because uh, we didn't have a copy of the new plans and so we were working on, you know, to the best of our ability. Uh, that the top of the seven-story Texas wraparound on the bluff will be approximately 760 feet above sea level. Mike, I have a question. How tall, and anybody can answer this question, how tall is the Texas wraparound? 77, okay. So I had nine, we had 95 feet. So, so that, that would, uh, that would uh, clar clarify that discrepancy. So I think it was just presented, you're at, so you're at 848 feet. We met with staff on Tuesday, December 12th and requested to see the stormwater runoff management report that is being completed. However, we were told that it is still not available to us. We would like to access this report so that we can critically analyze it. We are asking for a continuance until such time as this report is released and our subsequent time FOIA request has been processed. We have learned that we have to check on a daily basis to see if any new information has become available. We believe the proper body we believe the proper body to take our stormwater management current concerns is the Westmont Planning and Zoning Com Commission. So now we did get an update from um, Noriel, so thank you very much. But we, you know, when I'm writing this, we, we didn't have that. So, so you know, and that was great information, Noriel, but we want to see the actual report so we could critically analyze it. Trees, and so we, we do have the trees up there. Um, we're going to talk about concerns we have with the trees. Since 2011, I have served as the tree specialist for the Saddlebrook Community Association Board, and I contracted for and coordinated the trunk injection with triage of 463 of our street parkway and bike path ash trees. I also helped coordinate the treatment with safari of 249 of our honey locusts suffering from lacanium scale. Finally, finally I'm coordinating the treatment of a row of 14 consecutive street parkway oak trees that we believe might be suffering from oak wilt, a fungal disease. By using the tree inventory listed in the developer's new plans, we noted that at least 50 trees have been recommended for removal due to the, to the construction of the seven-story Texas wraparound. So you'll see those on the diagram, all the X's are the trees that are being removed. Some of those are buckthorns, and we agree with uh, the removal of the buckthorns. One of them is a, uh, uh, an ash tree um, that uh, probably had the emerald ash borer. We agree with that one too. So I didn't count that in, uh, in the 50, uh, 50 trees. I thought it wouldn't be fair. But we have identified 24 additional trees that are approximately 20 to 60 feet from the construction area that are likely to die either because they are likely within the drip line of the tree and the protected root zone, PRZ, will likely be disturbed. There are many additional oak trees that we, will, we believe will suffer from having the remote roots injured by the construction. I'm now going to quote from the Protecting the Trees from Construction Damage, a homeowner's guide from the University of Minnesota Extension. And I just uh, submitted that to Joe for the public record. Oak wilt is a lethal fungal disease normally spread through root grafts between adjoining oak trees. The disease also may be spread overland by sap beetles of the family Nididolidae, oh, it's a scientific term. In Minnesota, construction activity, activities that, re, that re injure roots, break branches, or otherwise open a wound on an oak, oak before April 1st and July 1st provide the beetles easy access to transmit the fungus. Now this is very interesting. Some studies have found the occurrence of oak wilt to be four times more likely within 160 feet of a construction site. Using a measure of 160 feet, quite a few of the old oak trees on the downslope bluff will likely be impacted by oak wilt after the proposed construction. We also have uh, submitted in the public record uh, a report from an arborist of uh, Bartlett trees uh, who is uh, backing up a lot of what we just said. Oak trees also suffer from oak blight, 
another fungal disease, according to the 2016 University of Minnesota Extensions article, a bad year for oak blight. Once the, idea, once, the, once the tree is stressed with oak blight, it is vulnerable to secondary pests and pathogens, according to the same art article. And then the last factor, when, when you're trying to protect the trees, and I know you want to protect them, altering the water drainage can also adversely affect oak trees. Now my final category is soil testing. We have, contact, we have contracted with Huff & Huff, an environmental firm. Huff & Huff has previous experience performing soil tests for the Timber Trails golf course development. They worked for the Village of Western Springs. They also performed soil tests on the golf course in Mission Hills in Northbrook. We are asking for permission from the owner of the Oak Brook Hills golf course to allow Huff & Huff Incorporated to perform limited soil tests of a portion of the greens and the tee box areas of the golf course and some areas at the top of the downslope bluff with the protected oak trees. If this area uh, does have uh, uh, a high concentration of arsenic, it's going to be very difficult to remediate. We'd like to determine if the soil exceeds the Illinois Pollution Control Board 13 milligrams over one kilogram of remedial objective for the arsenal and soils. Are there any questions? I have no questions at this time, but I appreciate all your information and all your right. points. Thank you for the Thank presentation. You. And who's next? Happy holidays, everybody. Thank you. Um, my name is Jean Doyle. I'm a resident um, of Indian Trails and a board member across the street. Uh, I, I'm here as one of 180 homeowners uh, that are going to be directly impacted by this development. It has come to our attention recently that there's been a request for a special use request. And as such, there are six um, issues uh, within that special use request and upon review we feel that there are three of them that um, are going to that the special re request the special use request is not um, addressing you know one of them is that the established maintenance or operation of the special use will not be detrimental or endanger the public health safety morals comfort or general we welfare um, of the surrounding areas and uh, People have addressed the stormwater issue, which is an issue of serious concern to the homeowners at Indian Trail. We've had ongoing and increasing issues over the last few years, which the village is well aware of. Another issue is that the special use will not be injurious to the use and enjoyment of other property in the immediate vicinity for the purpose already permitted nor substantially diminish or impair property values within the neighborhood. I've lived here for 17, almost 18 years. Uh, one of the things that I appreciate is the open area, the golf course, uh, that the golf course represents to the area. Um, so, and I do think this is going to significantly impact our property values. It is not single family homes, it is rental property. Um, and then the last one is that um, the special use request needs to address adequate measures uh, to provide ingress and egress. And when I hear parking for 1,100 cars, 1,100 cars, I stop and think about how much longer it's going to take me to get out of Indian Trails to go north to go to work every day. Um, 1,100 cars is a lot. And um, not everybody obviously is going to go to work at the same time, but there's going to be a large number of people that are going to be going to work between, say, 6.30, 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. So um, I am, I'm, I'm very concerned. And as one of 180 homeowners that is directly across the street, we only, we really feel that we're going to be severely impacted. Thank you. Everybody have a great holiday. Thank you very much. Same to you, too. Next, please. Good 
Good evening. Hello. Um, I'd like to, uh, my name is Frank Gonzalez, and uh, I live at 3525 South Cass Court in, in Westmont, and uh, otherwise known as Royal Hills, which is exactly across the street from the uh, new apartment building, proposed apartment building. I'd like to uh, mention a few specific quotes except, excerpted from a portion of the Village of Westmont's comprehensive plan adopted on February 19th, 2013. I know most of you have probably read every single letter on, the, on that 180 odd pages like I did, but I would just like to make this statement and I'll be brief. The linking page on the village's website says that the following, Westmont's comprehensive plan update provides a great opportunity for residents to communicate what they believe to be the strengths and weaknesses of the community and to prioritize what issues are most important for the village to address in the near term and in the future. The planning process is designed to promote community involvement and encourage citizen participation. Community outreach is included throughout the entire planning process. We know that the success of the, this planning effort will depend upon engaging our community. Um, I've also printed copies of what I just passed out to the commissioners, and uh, it was on the table outside for anybody who wanted, wants to take a copy home, or just go to the village website and research it yourself. However, quickly, page one, introduction. This update comprehensive plan addresses changes that have occurred in the past 14 years and sets a course to guide land use decision making for the next 10 to 15 years. Page two, purpose of the plan. The comprehensive plan serves as the village official policy guide for physical improvement and development. At the most basic level, the comprehensive plan should direct orderly growth and change as well as maintain and enhance livability of the village. Page seven, community outreach. The planning process for the Westmont Comprehensive Plan sought input from a broad spectrum of the community, including residents, business and property owners, community service providers, elected slash appointed officials, students and village staff. A variety of outreach efforts were used to promote multiple avenues to gather feedback regarding existing conditions, local issues, needs and aspirations. Outreach exercises were also used to promote a sense of community and foster stewardship <coughs> for the plan by underscoring that participants' voices have been heard and their ideas influenced to final decisions. Page 15, community workshop. Residents are concerned about the high level of rental housing in the community. Page 23, business outreach. When asked what type of new development or uses they would not like to see, 80.5% chose apartments slash rental housing, followed by 43.9% who chose industrial slash manufacturing, and 24.4% who chose hotel slash lodging. Page 47, village services and objectives. Goal 2.8, coordinate with adjacent communities including Clarendon Hills, Donners Grove, Darien, Oak Brook, Hinsdale, and Willowbrook in realizing mutual objectives and addressing issues such as traffic that transcends municipal boundaries. Page 49, land use plan, planning area. Illinois statutes allow for a community to plan for its growth areas one and one half miles beyond its municipal limits, municipal code listed. Page 52, land use plan, single family detached residential. Single family detached residential is and should continue to be the prominent land use designation in the village. Page 53, land use plan, multi-use residential. Responding to community input, the comprehensive plan identifies no additional multifamily residential areas but does provide for multifamily units as a component of mixed use development within downtown. Page 59, 
re residential areas plan, context sensitive development. New development should be context sensitive and compatible with the existing scale and density of the existing and established neighborhood. However, as a measure to protect its neighborhoods, the village should continue to enforce code and ordinance. Page 61, residential area plans, multifamily residential. Responding to community input, the comprehensive plan identifies no additional multifamily residential areas, but does provide for multifamily units as a component of mixed use development within downtown. A priority of the community is to achieve the appropriate balance of single family and multi-family residential in the village to ensure the established character of the community is reinforced as a single family detached community. As I promised, I would not editorialize. Thank you for listening and thank you for your service. Thank you, appreciate it, thanks. Next, please. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, for I think I've met some of you, some of you I have not. My name is Karen Bushy, and I have lived in Oak Brook since 1973, so I'm pretty familiar with much of the development that's gone on both in Westmont and in Oak Brook, and really pretty much <laughs> the whole area. Um, I first of all wanted to say. Uh, that I, and I'm only speaking for myself, I have no longer the right to speak for the village of Oak Brook, and I no longer, and I am not part of the Saddlebrook um, board of residents, um, so I'm just here as a private resident that um, has done some of this stuff. Um, but I, so I wanted to start by saying I really appreciate um, the work that you all did in moving the natatorium and changing it around and um, what you've done around that, I think that is really nice. And um, that, to me, is a good indication of, of collaboration, cooperation, and willingness to work with the people that have had some real concerns. So I compliment you on, on that because it took a lot of work and a lot. <laughs> I've done it, and, and I understand. So I wanted you to know that I, I really appreciate that. Um, my area of concern is based on a lot of what I did when I had the privilege of being in office. For those of you that I haven't met, um, I served the Village of Oak Brook in government for 26 years, uh, plan started the plan commission, uh, then became a trustee, and then became president of the village for three terms, and uh, also served as president of DuPage mayors and managers and the vice chairman of the DuPage County Stormwater Commission, mostly because I didn't have anything else to do. Um, <laughs> Um, I am not an expert, and I don't even play one on the radio, but I've just done it a lot. So I have just some observations, and um, my uh, focus of interest, and I think many of you who are in public service find that you, you gravitate to a, an area of interest. Um, um, some people, it, it's planning and zoning, some of it it's de uh, development of your commercial areas, and I'll, mine was, um, emergency management and disaster mitigation. And it was, I had the privilege of serving on the DuPage County Emergency Management Committee and then did work with um, IEMA, uh, the Illinois Emergency Management down in Springfield. So when I look at, at plans or ideas or what, my head goes <laughs> towards safety and um, safety concerns. And uh, the direction that I'm would like to just offer some comments on is, first of all, uh, the schematics that we see and the comment that was made at the last meeting, and I think I've been to every meeting that you all have had on the subject, said that the uh, egress from the property, which the single point egress, I still don't understand how that, that can be um, justified, but 
said it's a three-lane egress. Um, as of an hour and a half ago when I drove it, it's a two-lane egress that flares to three lanes at the at Midwest Road for uh, to accommodate a right-hand turn lane that's um, must, much as I could guess in the rain, it looks like two lengths of my enclave. So it, it I, I think it's the record should be correct um, that it, it uh, is a very poorly striped in the rain. You can't even see the striping, but it's basically is a two lane egress with a, a flare to a third lane for, for uh, two, two, car, two vehicles stacking to turn right. Um, <coughs> All of us understand the difference in carrying capacity in a two-lane function as opposed to a three-lane function. And when you've got that many cars moving out of that kind of a facility, it does make a difference. <coughs> um, and, and if you're going to stick with a one, one exit entrance point for this huge of a facility, um, perhaps you would consider it making it a true three lane, especially an exit, you've got to be able to get people out of there. And maybe um, if you uh, worked to the north and where there's not trees and all to be impacted, and just it, even if you're going to, like I say, if you're going to stick with that one uh, ingress and egress point, if you could it make, make that truly three lanes, that, that would be something I think to really consider because the ability then to, to uh, get <clears throat> emergency uh, if you've got something going on and you get an ambulance trying to get out of there with, with, with a patient um, you, you're going to have a situation that's not going to be pleasant so I, I would urge you to consider that kind of a, of a reconfiguration um, I, th I think um, one of the things that is really important for the residents that you represent is for them to have some, because this is big. I mean, we all know it. It, 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 it's a wow. And I think the average resident wants to know, um, you know, they hear the acronyms, they hear the, the, the technical numbers flying around and all, and to the average resident, they're like, you gotta be kidding me, and they don't really understand it. From all those that I've talked to, those that, that don't really understand it, is the safety of having a garage inside um, this, this apartment building. How that safety is gonna be addressed. You all may be very comfortable with it, but I have to tell you the general public is not. Um, most of the, uh, and they call, it, they call it donut buildings, they call it Texas wraparound, it has all kinds of names in the building business. But most of them have a, a a separate garage is built as a structure and then anywhere from 10 to 12 feet of open space around that and then the building ringed around it. So it's really two, two separate, totally separate structures. And that allows for the, if it's a open side ramp, it allows for, for air movement and all. From all I can tell looking at this, and I may be totally incorrect, but this is the impression the general public has, it's going to be a monolithic building. And if that is indeed the case, where are the fumes going to go when if you've, you've got even 100 people leaving for work within an hour and all those engines starting up, then I open the door to, to leave, whoosh, comes the, the, the fumes from, from all that exhaust and goes right down the hallway of that building. And I've had several people ask about that and I frankly didn't know the answer. And I say, perhaps you do, and perhaps you've looked at all this, but I, I can only encourage you to let people know um, how, how is this really going to work. The um, NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association, which is the standard for the country that your fire department as well as ours uh, follows, um, has, they, they lay out the, the processes and those um, strictures of what, what you need to follow. And they, they're the ones that say, you know, a 20 foot um, driveway width for the, um, for the um, fire trucks. And they give all these standards and it's easier to follow what they say than to try and develop them on our own because none of us, no village can afford to do that. And they're usually fair, pretty fair. Um, but my question also goes to sprinkling of that garage. Um, some 20, 
21 years ago, um, our fire chief, who was named Bob Nielsen, uh, worked with the state of Illinois and realized the, the danger of the newer cars that um, are with the higher test gas and the fact that our cars are made out of so many so much synthetic as opposed to steel and wool um, upholstery and all it's almost all synthetic now they burn hotter they burn quicker and the flames from a, a burning car go out and especially if there's a because uh, there it's a tilt tilt concrete ramp I'm sure I can't believe they'd be doing anything else but that and the, the um, concrete serves as a lid for the heat and the flame of, of a burning car so that it goes out, usually to the cars that are next to it. I, I've just not seen any comfort to anybody, including the people in those apartments. How are those fires going to be put out? And to think it doesn't happen, one needs only go to Oak Brook Center <laughs> and see how often we're dealing with car fires in there. It's pathetically frequent, not every day obviously but it happens and when it happens it's devastating and it happens I say honestly fairly frequently enough so that we have forced in Oak Brook all of our garages now uh, have dry stand sprinkling systems in them to to protect it because the thing is you can't get an engine in there you can't even get a uh, high box am ambulance in there and so that becomes the question if you have a tragedy in that garage what are you going to do um, I, I, I think those are fair questions. They're questions that I've heard from, from residents, and I would urge you to, to consider those. Um, the other, and, and the other reason that I, I bring it up is because I, I know that, at least I don't think you're part of Mabus 12 for the fire department. I, maybe some of you know that. Um, all I could find is that you have a, a fire protection agreement with Woodridge, um, with uh, Tri-State and with Northwest Mount Fire Protection District, but I didn't see a Mabus agreement. We have a mutual aid agreement. Uh, I'm sorry? I heard a voice. <laughs> Up here. Oh, I'm sorry. I, didn't, I couldn't see who was the, talking. The fire department does have a mutual aid agreement, so. With? Uh, I think every surrounding community or most of the surrounding communities. Okay, because most of them do it through the Mabus mutual aid okay. box alarm system. And, and I don't know if we're part of that or not, but I know. Yeah, I don't think you um, are. And, and, you know, again, it's not up to me to tell you that you ought to join it. But the, the point of it is that we passed out a, a, a PowerPoint um, presentation that was made by Montgomery County in Maryland, their fire department. They are the fire, one of the fire departments that is directly responsible for answering and assisting in any fire in Washington, D.C., any of the, the government buildings there. So they're pretty much on top of their game when it comes to, to um, um, figuring out how to deal with, with fires in, in public buildings. And um, they are the source of the PowerPoint that, that we gave you a copy of. Um, they, and just, just to give you one example, NFPA says that those exit stair towers um, for four stories or more are required to have two hour rated door assemblies. So I mean there's very, what I'm, what I'm suggesting to you is there's a whole series and system of rules and regulations for protecting those doors between <coughs> however these people are going to enter these hallways. They talk about um, stretching hose. Anytime they have to stretch up to 200 feet of hose is a nightmare for a fire department. And perhaps this has all been gone through all I'm saying is your general public doesn't know that and they're a little <laughs> scared. So if I can just offer that to you as a suggestion, um, I think you'd go a long way towards ameliorate, ameliorating a lot of the concerns and fears if you would really address the safety of that garage because to most of it, it looks like a tragedy waiting to happen and that would be sad. So thank you for your time and attention. I am most grateful. Thank you too. Appreciate your comments and questions. Hi, I'm Alan Hanslick and part of the same group and I'm going to be the last member speaking so you can take a sigh of relief. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but first I wanted to thank your staff, uh, wonderful people, very knowledgeable. Uh, we've asked them a lot of questions and they're among the best we've seen, so thank you. Uh, 
we've expressed some of our concerns uh, today, uh, and I'll, I'll mention a few of them again. Um, and that is, uh, this is going to be an upscale apartment projected to house 588 people, including children. And yet there is no open space, no green space. Originally, staff recommended 3.09 acres um, for children. It's a trade-off since the golf course is there that will count to replace what would normally be required. But think about that upscale apartment. You got a kid, you say, go play on the golf course. Not going to work. So we're concerned that that is not the correct way to approach this apartment. Uh, second of all, um, as we said before, you remember our Costco analogy, 2.6 times the size of Costco. But it's also another analogy. It's 40% larger than the hotel. So when you look at that hotel, this is a massive, massive structure in a residential neighborhood. And we have very significant concerns. Normally, a building of this size per staff would require 29 acres of property around it. Because there is a golf course there, which will eventually be sold and developed, we, you, are allowing this massive structure to be put on nine acres of property, not 29. So to the people in the community right by it, they have a totally different picture than what statistically may be the case because there's a golf course over there. We have ongoing and significant concerns about the heritage oak trees. They were mentioned, you're taking great mitigation efforts, but the reality is you are allowing the placement of this apartment critically close to the root systems of those oak trees that have been here for 200 years. We did, I did, put a letter in file from um, the company that takes care of uh, the trees in the Midwest Club. The arborist who wrote it played with, under those oak trees when he was a child. And he said, you should expect those trees will not survive with construction this close. Lastly, our concern is safety. To be honest, we don't think Westmont is approaching this in the safest manner possible. Number one, road traffic and congestion. Number two, providing first responders the quickest and safest access to a catastrophe with one entrance and one exit. And number three, to your surrounding residents by allowing one of the highest structures in Westmont to be on the highest point in that area, the highest topography in that area, a fairly new building concept, which many states have contained to three or four stories high only, depending on the type of construction. This is seven stories. It is a fairly new kind of technology, but you're allowing it to be placed in the middle of a residential area. It's primarily a parking garage on the highest piece of land. So if you were a neighbor in that area, you would have some cause for concern also. So we have an alternative. And we knew we couldn't get the alternative we wanted, which would be not an apartment at all. But this is at least a compromise. So right in this area, right over there. All right, thanks. And this compromise suggests that if this apartment were moved slightly east and slightly south and rotated, it would accomplish several things. Number one, the topography of that land runs 10 to 25 feet below where this building is projected to be put at this point. So for the benefit of the neighbors, you would get an immediate benefit by lowering the structure 10 to 25 feet. 
Number two, it removes the building completely away from the old oak trees. There will not be damage to the trees. In addition, as we did tree counts, literally on the ground, it will destroy fewer trees <coughs> because of the building footprint. Number three, it allows for that three acres of open land that should exist for an upscale apartment that is going to have children. If you really think about it, you don't want to send your kids over to a golf course to play. And most importantly, uh, I know in the conversation today there was a lot of, there were quite a few uh, photographs about the oak trees hiding the buildings and so on and so forth, so on and so forth. But you know, those oak trees only have leaves six months of the year, right? So I don't know what happens as far as shielding this building the remaining six months. This is a structure that's going to run 95 odd feet high from Cass Avenue and above. And it will be very visible six months of the year. So our, our neighbors in Westmont and Oak Brook, we have concerns about this structure. We have concerns about it attracting lightning because of its height and its location about a potential fire and the impacts that could have on neighbors, and about the lack of potential first class response times in a new structure that frankly you guys are gonna be learning about and you're willing to accept with, with fairly minimal entry and exit points. So thank you for your time and uh, thank you to staff. Thank you very much. Appreciate your coming up. Who, uh, who would like to speak next? <clears throat> Hello. <clears throat> Good evening. I'm Beth Marchetti. I'm the executive director of the DuPage Convention and Visitors Bureau, and it's great to see most of you here, many of you here tonight. Um, thank you for your support of tourism, uh, West Village of Westmont, of course, Village of Oakbrook as well. So I just wanted to be here tonight to represent tourism. And I know there's lots of conversations, but I do want to point out a few things about the Natatorium project. Um, we went through a strategic plan starting about two years ago. And one of the outcomes is a sports study. So we're in the midst of that right now for DuPage County. Chairman Cronin had asked us to look at the county fairgrounds as a potential um, viable property for sports. Um, we really feel that in DuPage we are primed to be a, a sports leader. We're very fortunate here because our local sports venues are already being used. So to have this project would enable us to have a world-class facility that we can now sell and bring in um, NCAA um, high school and as well as Olympic um, prior Olympic events. Um, right now, tourism in DuPage is a $2.5 billion industry. Um, sports has seen a 10% growth in the last year. So it is um, a very huge recession-proof business, and we have a dedicated sports salesperson who actually goes out and, and secures sports tournaments. Um, since 2014, the DuPage CVB has assisted in booking more than 60 events, um, which represents 60,000 visitors and $12 million in economic impact. So this truly is a driver for um, economic vitality in DuPage. We are losing market share to our competitors in Indiana and Wisconsin particularly, and we just want to be able to be a fourth, uh, leader in this industry. So um, I am in support of the Natatorium for sure. Um, we have about 115 hotels in DuPage County, and so to have this world-class event uh, facility here would be able to lure events that would help um, fill those hotel rooms. And then um, lastly, that what I want to leave you with is um, we had an event in May at, the, at one of our larger hotels in Lombard, the weightlifting, U.S. powerlifting. Um, it is the road to the Olympics. It hasn't been back in Chicago since 1924. 
And so those are the kind of events that we're able to bring to our area um, as we continue to explore the different opportunities. So from a tourism standpoint, this is a, a really great project, and I just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Beth. <clears throat> Who else would like to speak tonight? Okay. Well, at this point, I'd like to uh, ask members of the HARP group to come up and uh, perhaps you could address some of these things. Um, one of them I would like to hear in particular would be uh, the discussion about the safety of the, the Texas wrap brought up by, uh, by Karen Bushy. Sure. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for their time the last uh, many, many, many months. Um, in particular, the uh, planning commissioners, but most importantly, the village staff. They've been incredible to work with. And, um, you know, kind of segueing into safety, I have absolutely no doubt that uh, Westmont Police Department and the Fire Department here are more than up to the task of, uh, you know, doing their job and making sure that we build this, number one, to the existing codes, which obligate us to make sure that it is safe and should anything happen, um, to respond to the same. Um, I believe they're completely up to the task. Um, the, um, you know, in terms of the code, I believe, in a, Rick, if I'm incorrect, uh, please correct me, but there's a two-hour firewall. Uh, between the garage and the apartments, which is what the code is. Um, you know, so that requires a construction type. You know, usually it's, you know, we've got concrete on most of the exterior of that, but then, you know, two layers of drywall to create a two-layer two wall. Um, the apartment buildings are sprinklered. The garage is sprinklered. Um, you know, not unlike any uh, any parking deck in Oak Brook or Lombard or any other community. Um, it's, it's what we're obligated to do. And, um, you know, there are, uh, you know, a host of building codes. And, you know, with respect to, you know, stormwater, arsenic, um, you know, there are all kinds of uh, local, state, and federal regulations that we are obligated to follow and will follow. Um, so, you know, I, I think we can, uh, you know, set our mind at ease that, you know, the Village of Westmont is more than up to the task of um, enforcing their own rules and regulations. Um, you know, with respect to, you know, Mr. Hanslick's comment about rotating at 90 degrees and rolling it down the hill, I don't know how that affects his uh, neighbors at Indian Trails, but to me that makes it significantly worse for them, which is the you know the apartment community that or townhome community and the apartment community next to them that is in Westmont. You know, rather than shielding it with the oak grove trees, it shoves it down the hill and says, you know, Oak Brook can't see it, but Westmont can, um, which I, you know I think is an inferior solution. The reason we set it up that way, and you know, Rick. Faywell and I together have done about $500 million worth of development. And on the front end, we're always extremely careful about how we're site planning things. You know, the building faces the way it does, that our residents have views of that beautiful oak grove um, out of the, um, it'd be kind of the facing northwest and then also facing southeast over what is currently the back nine, but it'll be, a, you know, relatively low density, um, you know, housing, lots of green and open space, light and air. And then, the, you know, the narrow part, um, you know, faces our parking lot. Mr. Hanslick's solution has half the building facing the Oak Brook Hills parking lot. Um, you know, that's not good, you know, in terms of quality of life for the uh, residents that will live there. It's not good in terms of generating uh, rent to, to pay for it. So we, we set it up specifically for a very strong reason, both aesthetic and economic. Um, you know, so I, th I think that um, the, you know, you know, suggestion is, is an inferior one to, to what we have, uh, you know, have already placed. Um, in terms of the, you know, the children, are there going to be children here potentially I'm sure there will at some point the rents that we're going to be charging once you know and, and ultimately parents make their own choices I'm not here to tell anyone how to raise their own children I think what the vast majority of people would do if you're paying the kind of rents it's going to be for a two-bedroom apartment here you can more than uh, amply afford a mortgage and um, you know there's a you know great housing stock in downtown Westmont and you know the surrounding area um, that you know is phenomenal for families I think that was the first one you saw, uh, first case you had tonight. Um, you know, somebody doing really creative with a new home on a you know unique lot, and you know when I was here last time, I didn't know there were 330 foot deep single family lots in Westmont. What the hell was I thinking? Um, so you know, there, there's plenty of housing stock for them, and I think you know most of the people will make an economic decision. That being said, you know, immediately to the southeast of the apartment building is the you know the putting course. There's a walking trail all over the place. Um, there's sidewalks to Casa Midwest, and there's parks at uh, you know, Ty Warner very close uh, for the residents of the community to embrace. So um, you know, is it perfect for a family? Probably not, and that's by design. You know, we want this to be renters by choice in a luxury community. Um, and you know, we're, we're not necessarily encouraging children to live here. Um, 
furthermore, that also reduces the burden on schools. Um, when we design it you know, in, into this particular standard, the schools get a, you know, a very large economic tax uh, benefit from the apartments with likely you know, a very negligible impact on their uh, student population. So it should be a win for them as well. Um, any other questions? I'll, you know, like I can let Rick handle if you've got them or you want to go to the next one. Uh, that was my question for right now. We'll have some commissioner comments in just a minute. Uh, staff, anything else that you would like to ask or add to this now that we've gotten this far? No, Mr. Chair. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, we will now go to uh, commissioners, and I'm going to begin with uh, Commissioner uh, Carmichael. I, uh, thanks again for everybody for your comments. Again, I, I think most of my questions have been answered. I would uh, like to see a little more of uh, Mrs. Bush's uh, uh, comment about the three-lane egress uh, that the the departure from the property is not really three lanes that it's it, would widening is it possible to widen that would you consider widen that would that make it would that make egress safer if if that street were widened uh, I think it's perfectly safe again to, to repeat what we said at the last meeting uh, the ingress and egress point there was designed for 750,000 feet of office uh, what we're doing is significantly less impactful than what it was what it was designed for um, you know, I've you know, obviously been at the resort many, many times. There are three lanes out. Um, ultimately, two lanes does transition to three, but it's more than two cars. Ultimately, if there's problems there, is there land on the north side there to widen that lane a little bit? Yeah. Um, right now, our you know, expert traffic study says it's completely unnecessary. Um, and I'll rely on, on, on his take um, you know, as my you know, expert source. Thank you. And most of my concerns have been uh, uh, in, in this latest round have been with the landscaping thing. I, I'm, I'm glad to see uh, that they have the conservation easement in place for the Oak Grove. Uh, this retaining wall on the east side of the natatorium, uh, I, I think was a, you know, an extra effort on your part uh, to protect those, particularly those three uh, townhouses that are, are right east of, of the uh, natatorium. Uh, additional plantings, uh, the restrictive covenant with the uh, park district uh, and the and the buffer zone for the townhouses there, and as part of that uh, part of that agreement, uh, I, I think the applicant has has made sincere and, and really extensive efforts here the, the past year to uh, to accommodate complaints and and. Uh, I know there are, this is, is a major impact on the area. I'm, I'm not trying to downplay it. It, 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 it certainly will be. Uh, but I'm satisfied that uh, uh, this is ready to go forward to the village board. And that's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner Carmichael. Commissioner Van Buren. I do appreciate all the time that uh, staff has put in this and also the response both of the homeowners associations and the <clears throat> Petitioner, um, I do have in connection with uh, uh, Karen Bushy's uh, comments. Um, if there were a fire in uh, in the uh, on one of the cars in the uh, garage, water sprinklers aren't much help. And if that were the case, Ansel extinguishers. But I don't know. Uh, usually, that's used in kitchens where you have a possibility of fire. Is that a lot more expensive process to? To do. Sorry, Ansel. Ansel extinguisher, yeah. which would suppress a probably do a, a job of suppressing an auto fire, whereas water or sprinkler coming on probably wouldn't do it. Right, and typically that's that's something that's on site that can be handled ideally by a professional, but usually by just pretty much anybody to put out a fire. A lot of people carry those in their car as well. <laughs> So anyway, uh, and as we mentioned before, the entire garage is a two-hour rating all around the perimeter. Everything that uh, she brought up is, about NFPA is absolutely true. And of course, uh, we use that code uh, for every building, every instance, garage included. So um, the, as far as the exhaust, the, she asked about fumes. 
there's going to be carbon monoxide uh, sensors that will then trigger fans that exhaust carbon monoxide if the level gets high. Uh, for any fumes, it would relative to a fire. The garage is essentially open air, so it, it you know, if you think about it, it's just ramps like this, so it's entirely you know open uh, to the to the exterior. So um, there shouldn't be any accumulation of, of fumes and things like that. And typically, I mean, I, I you know, in a, in an instance of a car actually being on fire, um, you call fire department, they come, they put it out. I mean, we're doing, we're going to be doing everything that's in NFPA, as she mentioned, uh, which is standard procedure, and I think, as Peter pointed out, pretty typical for any garage in the area. Okay. Thank Good you. enough? Uh, I'm going to ask you again, which I did last time, um, is there any reason why you would feel that we, as staff, that we are not prepared to make a decision, or you feel we should not be prepared? Any of you? From an engineering standpoint, we are already making recommendation for approval. Okay. And uh, the planning zoning staff? I think that the responses to all the requirements for planning and zoning have been made. Obviously, there are still things that you have to consider, such as the parking variance that is, a, 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 you know, until the building gets built, that staff can't comment on, on that. It, it, it's, it's, but in general, staff is satisfied with, with all the responses and the documents that have been provided. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Commissioner Thomas. Um, at one point, um, I took the presentation you guys put together um, to work just to show them what we, we were doing. And they were, whoa, they were very, very impressed with that. The very first comment that I got from, and these are not architects or anything like that, I work for Amtrak, you know, so, uh, is what would happen if there was a fire in the garage. And, and uh, Ms. Bush uh, said that uh, the public had concerns. Um, and I, I would, as opposed to having an architect tell me that um, he did, he did um, say about it being open, open air and about uh, fans uh, being turned on or from a sensor in that. Um, the result, is, the, the comment kind of casual that they would just had call the fire department and have them come put it up. That's, that's too casual of a response for me. And I would, I would like to see or hear from our fire department or, or, or somebody from, with a knowledge about the workings of how that would, or, or the architect can re, um, answer my concerns about, about how, how that would work. We you know? build this to the same standard that Oak Brook would, the same standard that any other community would. I, I don't there, care about Oak Brook. I don't know. So it's a, it's, a fully sprinkler, it's a fully sprinkler parking deck. Okay, that's what I want yeah. explained to me. Yeah, so it's, it's fully sprinklered, and it meets every code that your fire department uh, requires, and every project I've ever done, the first thing I do is I go meet with the fire department as we're going through building, I say, what do you want? on top of that. So we're going to meet your code, and if your fire department wants something that's reasonable, we'll give it to them on top of code. So again, it's a fully sprinkler building. I park every day. Um, our office is at 601 Oakmont. You know, there's a big surface lot, but then there's also an underground uh, parking uh, structure underneath the building. So there's, you know, whatever, 120,000 foot building, and the cars are at the base of it. Totally inside, one in, one out. And, you know, if there's a fire, it's sprinklered. There's only one way out, you know, and well, I shouldn't say there's stairs too. So it, 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 you know, things like this, you know, you've got experts within your community, in, within the fire department, but there's also building codes that we are obligated to follow that have been developed over, you know, candidly, lots of tragedy. Um, and so every, as the building gets better, and if you look at the, um, you know, the building type that we're doing, you know, it's high rise. There's not a stick of wood in here. This isn't a wood frame building. It's concrete and steel. So that is a, the safest building class we can possibly build for you. So, so. And that's, I mean, to me, inside the apartment's more important than inside the garage. 
Right. So, so in, in as far as you are concerned and your architect is concerned, there is no um, situation where the smoke is just being sucked down into the hallways of the apartment building um, because absolutely of the fire. No, absolutely not. There's a there's a two hour firewall there, um, which you know, and for the, you know, I'm I'm a layman, but I've been at this a while. That means a fire can burn on one side of the wall for two hours before it goes through. Except when he opens the door. And you know the, the smoke, you know, smoke goes up. Right. So as an open air, with it would just basically go up until it would go out. It, it's not going to fill. And it is open air. So it, well, it's surrounded by the apartment buildings, but the the deck itself is open air with the ramps. So there's there is natural uh, ventilation in there, and then also a fan system. Um, I would think I don't know what happens here in a in a in a fire situation, but you know typically they would you know want fans blowing smoke out. So you know that's what we're obligated to do. Um, is to meet every code. I, you, know, you know, frankly, I find this to be a bit of a red herring. You know, I think they don't want an apartment building, so they're going to keep hanging their hat on something to say, oh, you need a continuance. Okay. Commissioner Thomas, can I comment as well? Sure. I'd like to express our full confidence in our fire department's ability to meet with developers in advance to discuss safety considerations, which we've done multiple times, to review plans, our uh, fire our fire prevention Bureau director is a master building code professional, and he will be seeing all of these plans throughout the permit process um, and require appropriate fire suppression systems. Uh, we have stricter local building code requirements for the pro proposed apartment building than many nearby communities, including Lyle and Wheaton. So. I may not have just liked the way it was presented, may possibly. Um, we also have I, a. I agree with, with if. if our staff is satisfied with it. I am satisfied with Our it. Our professional trained fire department staff is very sufficient to handle this. They had to convince you, so. Uh, the other concern I had was, or question I had was for staff about me meeting with um, the county as far as um, traffic lights at, at the intersection, at the e exit, egress, and, and that. And um, and you guys were going to meet with them, or work, or have met met with them, and what what is needed, and what they feel would be okayed or permitted. Mm -hmm. And I want I want to know what kind of, if if any changes for the lighting light uh, traffic lights different kinds or, or whatever. They'll, they'll change want. the transition times likely, but they won't be changing the actual light. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, right now the county, um, as presented in the traffic study, they had recommended that there's actually no major improvements needed at the uh, intersection itself. Now, they did comment that they may look at the cycle timing of the uh, traffic signal. But at this point, right now, the recommendations s sound good. They do have some comments and um, that will be needed to be reviewed. Um, but more in the sense that they're looking for the completeness just to, for easy terminology, complete the package that study. But right now they're not proposing any new improvements at the intersection. And they didn't make any an, uh, comment on egress and, and three lanes leaving and, and like what we were just talking about? No comment. Okay. That's all I got. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Sherp. Chairman, I will be recusing myself uh, due to personal conflict of interest. Very good. Commissioner Bartell. Uh, two or three questions. Uh, can I assume there is a fire department access point other than the 35th Street and Cass? Is that what I'm, I'm am, I, uh, am I hearing there's another road uh, South, the ring around the building. or is um, that the only entrance and exit for the for hotel vehicle? and apartment? Their access would be, you know, at the main entry drive. Okay, so a fire engine could could not get in any other place other than the 35th and Cass. That's correct. Um, what? Uh, how can we be assured, relative to Mr. Corrin's uh, statement? How can we be assured that the trees will be maintained and or replaced as necessary? Uh, if that's a concern, you put it in a development agreement. Okay. Which trees are you referring the, to? The oak specifically. The uh, oak grove? If 
the oak trees if they are uh, damaged relative they're to damaged the construction? They're damaged or if there's any uh, death over time, they'll be subject right. to our heritage tree ordinance. Okay. All right. So they will be replaced. And um, what is the timeline for each phase, assuming this moves forward in 2018? Um, and I know there are phases, but uh, overall, all things being a go. Yeah, so Mary Ann is a little bit ahead of me. Um, she is uh, quite a lady, um, um, an absolute trailblazer and uh, you know, an incredible gift to this community. Um, so she has um, taken some level of risk and is you know, ahead of the apartment building in terms of its construction. Uh, that being said, I think she's ready to start, um, you know, you know, and get in for permit as soon as we're, we, you know, we get our final approval. She'll be full speed ahead, and it's probably 60 to 90 days uh, before we can pull a permit there. Um, in conjunction with that, um, we're working on a phasing plan to for the redevelopment of the parking lot. We obviously want to make sure that you know, we're serving our guests, uh, serving our customers, make sure we have enough construction traffic. Um, the apartment building is uh, probably you know, six months behind that, so I would say that's probably a late summer, early fall groundbreaking. Uh, for that, um, and we've got to get uh, final plans in, in you know, in for permit, and then um, you know, complete the financing. But I'm, you know, very far along on that. I've made a lot of progress in the last month or so, so I feel pretty good about that. Um, the R1 residential, I am in discussion with, um, you know, some local builders, but you know, that's obviously going to have to come back in um, as its own independent process for final approval. Right now, we're just getting the bulk R1 zoning. So they're going to have to come in and you know, do this whole process uh, for that portion of the project. Um, but I expect to have you know, that um, you know, builder slash partner uh, selected um, probably, you know, you know, I would say by the end of March, beginning of April, and that, that target, um, you know, have, a, you know, have somebody selected that we're willing to work with. I'm obviously sensitive as the hotel owner as to what those homes look like. Um, what their price target is, but um, I mean, I can. I'm happy to share that um, you know the people that I'm talking to. Everyone is, you know, their starting price is, is over a million dollars uh, for those. You're looking at um, you know a very very nice product. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Lavoy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have a, just a, a handful of questions. I, I, uh, at the last meeting, I asked a ton of questions, and I went through pretty quickly, and uh, I appreciate all your responses. Uh, it looks like you've addressed most of them. Uh, my biggest concern coming tonight was uh, the engineering plan, but I, I feel that uh, uh, Noriel uh, has got a uh, handle on exactly what needs to get done, <clears throat> and he is uh, one of the uh, engineers, and will be the engineer reviewing it, and I have total confidence in him to do that. But we're also here uh, understanding that uh, you're willing to cooperate and, and go back and forth with uh, the neighboring uh, engineering representatives and work through the solutions with them. Uh, and uh, you know, I want to recognize the fact that my comfort level is uh, uh, increased tremendously by uh, Webster McGrath and Bill Loftus being here uh, with this team of engineers. Uh, I think that you know, as far as the general public is concerned, uh, you can put your mind at rest. It will be done. It will be designed correctly. Uh, I would have liked to have seen it, but I know that I have a lot of confidence in the engineers that are here that are involved with the project. Um, I do have a couple of questions, uh, uh, and if you don't mind, if you could throw up the the traffic circulation plan for Lue, if I can ask you a couple of questions about it. This. No, traffic circulation. It was the one where we had uh, the overall site plan with yeah. the uh, direction uh, arrows on it. And uh, Louie, my concern here is that the, the egress from the apartment building uh, appeared to go all the way around the site and not down to the rotary. And I want to ask you, uh, you know, why that is and uh, want to understand that, that traffic pattern about why you're not taking uh, cars uh, to go out the intersection from the apartment building uh, to the rotary instead of going all the way around the site. Almost there. Hang on. <laughs> Next one. Nope. Next one. There we go. Yeah. 
this yes right yes that's yeah. correct so as you're you're leaving the uh, the apartment building on this plan um, you're not uh, the plan that I have anyway is a little different than this does not show egress going towards the rotary it shows the the, the egress going towards the hotel if I'm not mistaken, in the, in the plan that I received in my package. Now, there's a drive. Uh, you make a left uh, drive turn. comes out yeah, from the entry drive right here. I can't uh, see. Can't yeah, see. so yeah. Okay. just trying to see it. Um, you basically, an entry drive right here. These people will just take a left if they're leaving. Take a left and go around the rotary. Go right to the traffic circle. Right. Get out. Yep. Okay, and you don't have a, a problem with that? No, That's going to work no, fine? No, in fact, we made some changes just to make sure that. That there's no no parking aisles feeding into the windows from cars coming off the apartment building. We'll okay. The T intersection. Okay. Uh, uh, second question for you, the way is that the uh, I know at our, our prior meeting we discussed a uh, uh, construction entrance, a temporary entrance possibly, uh, to avoid conflicts with hotel operations and uh, the construction activity that's going to go on the site multiple times over a course of time. Um, do you think that there's a need for isolating uh, construction traffic? Yes, I've thought about that yet. Mm -hmm. uh, what, uh, um, I'm probably not the expert on this, but I know we've worked on uh, basically a laydown lane um, to you know, get the uh, you know, debris and dirt off the trucks and then uh, basically back out the main entrance. Um, in terms of the apartment, depending on the um, timing with the R1 land and, and how we actually transact that, it could make sense to put a haul road in and then you know, do something temporary out to Cass. Um, that could make some sense. I think for the natatorium, though, um, the idea is that it basically is going to be um, utilizing the, the main entry drive uh, out. That makes sense to me, too, but it, it might make a lot of sense while you're talking to uh, other county about access onto Cass for a temporary access to minimize the, uh, uh, the impact to operations at the mm -hmm. hotel. Right. Uh, Louie, while you're up there, uh, the concerns on, on Cass Avenue as far as egress, it's the, one of the residents brought up. Uh, uh, anyway, they're, they're, my question to you is, is that did your traffic study include a gap study? Um, no, we did not do a gap study. The intersection is signalized, so that's not necessary. Uh, well, where I'm, where I'm going here is as you travel southbound on Cass uh, from the signal at the entrance, uh, that that signal would provide a gap mm -hmm. for points of egress going northbound out of the uh, western side of Cass Avenue, correct? You, are you talking about further south where the uh, yes. single family area is concerned? Yes. Yes, absolutely. I mean, those those signals at south and north do provide the gaps. That's correct. That's where I'm going. I yes. want to make sure that the, uh, the residents understand. Traffic, tra traffic seems to be platooned because of that. Yes. Okay. Uh, that's all I have for you. I, right. I, you. I do have a, a couple other questions uh, uh, within the building. Uh, uh, could you elaborate on where the fire room is? I know there's been a Center. lot of discussion about uh, basically the fire department fights a fire differently in a high rise than they do a normal residential property and they're gonna they're gonna access the building from the main access. I don't see the fire room on here. Typically it's right off the main entry and that's where we would put it. We've left room there for that in that area. Okay, it's just not shown on the presentation at all. No, I mean we don't you know the drawings are conceptual. Yeah, I understand yeah. that. But right. there will be a fire room coming in. Yeah, there's a, there'll be a, a fire control center um, within the building, and the location of that is wherever the chief wants it. <laughs> That's how it works. I get right? that. Yes, and, and, and I I'm did, not being a nice guy there. It's wherever the chief wants it. <laughs> I, I understand that. I just didn't happen to see it, and that's kind of an important component that yeah. uh, I wanted to make mention anyway. Uh, and I, too, uh, reached out to the fire department directly as part of this review, and uh, they are, they are top-notch, and, and they've also... Uh, uh, weighed in on this pretty heavily and, and are in favor. Um, we talked at our last meeting about trash. Um, I don't. I, I didn't see you address it in your in your uh, presentation tonight. Yeah, on the plans, there it's very small because again, it's very. That's going to be a compactor. 
No, they'll just be, I think the last time I mentioned, there's just two bins that it comes down and it goes into those bins and those are sort of wheeled out at trash. And the truck's not entering the building, no. the truck is staying outside the building, right. it's getting rolled out. Right. Okay. Uh, you've addressed the, I think that the pedestrian plan, you've addressed the circulation around the building, uh, the fire access around the building. Uh, is that is that uh, that path uh, a paved path? Is that uh, what is what is the composition of that? Around the uh, around the natatorium, it's Grass Creek because we want that all to appear to be landscape. Uh -huh. Around the uh, apartment, it's permeable pavers. Okay. But well, we also talked about uh, a loading and unloading area. Everybody's going to move on a Saturday. It's an awful lot of units uh, to get moved, but uh, uh, is there any other provision that you've made to, to address? Uh, it's pretty standard for apartment buildings like this that you know you have to schedule your move. You can't just people can't just show up on Saturday. Understood. The so it's all scheduled. It's all regulated. Um, you know you typically can't move during the week. You know there's there there will be management issues. You know or, or policies set up for moving in, moving out, and that's that's typically the way it's done in any. Apartment building. Okay. Okay, I got to jump jump uh, topics a little bit here because I want to really understand the uh, the valet thing to address the variation uh, uh, request and the and the the shortfall uh, during that period of time. Um, how is you know where is that going to get parked? And if you could explain that in a little more detail, so I get it. I'm going to let Peter speak to that because that's a the valet can happen. Anywhere in the lot. Yeah, the so event. valet can go anywhere. To, again, where was Rick said, wherever the, you know, depending on where the event is. Uh -huh. You know, if it's a large auditorium event, you know, you're probably um, letting people self park closer to that and then valeting closer in front of the hotel and further out. Um, you know, the other way to uh, control parking is price. Um, if I charged a million dollars per spot, no one's parking there. Um, you charge a dollar per spot for an event, you know, it might discourage somebody, but probably not that many. Um, and, you know, for a major event, you will charge for parking. Um, and that will encourage carpooling. You let the families know that are part of this will meet. Hey, guess what? It's going to be 25 bucks. They carpool. Um, you know, the, and, and again, we are when everything is completed. I think I don't know whether it was 190 overparked there. Or so, so we're, we've overparked, um, you know, by you know, 185 spots or so. Um, once everything is complete, um, there will be a lead time and a build up, um, and it, basically a stabilization period for the natatorium. Um, you know, big swim meets aren't going to, you know, just take us at our word that everything's going to go swimmingly, pardon the pun, through development, and we're just going to magically open, you know, nine months after the fact, like we say we do. What happens is they say, we'll come see you when you're open, and then we'll book the next year. Um, so the first year, 18 months, are going to, you know, by nature, be a little bit slower. Um, by then, the apartments should be open. If not, then it's a management issue that we you know, deal with with the development agreement with staff. We limit the size of the um, attendance um, within within the natatorium to a certain amount unless we have a suitable parking uh, plan per the staff. And to that point, uh, the plan development agreement that was approved last year uh, and is going to be uh, re-approved if this project moves forward in a similar fashion requires uh, the natatorium owner to come before the village board with a specific parking plan for large scale events. And we define what large scale events are. And even with the apartment built and even with uh, sufficient parking for normal use for the large scale events, there are some concerns. We want to prevent parking on residential streets. And uh, the board will have to specifically sign off on a parking plan. There'll have to be a report after the event to see how parking went. And before subsequent events, they have to come back with a renewed parking plan that requires board approval. Okay, uh, I have a question about construction. Uh, do, you, do you have any intention of, of uh, any uh, kind of significant regrading uh, on the site uh, outside of the, the purview of uh, the apartment building and the auditorium? When you Other than excavation for stormwater. Uh, in a particular uh, uh, fill material? Uh, no, that's, I mean, I, I can't speak for the R1 because there's no plan there yet. Uh -huh. um, you know, I think, you know, ultimately there's, uh, the, the remaining nine holes need to be renovated. Um, you've got the R1 development that's going to impact the site. We've got, you know, between those two things, almost 100 acres. Um, the idea would be to try to keep all the fill on site. 
and balance it you know, with the, uh, the golf course. Our, my golf course architect has been working with uh, Rick and our civil team um, on you know, how much you know, haul off we're going to have. We don't know what the R1 is going to be. But in a, in a perfect world, that all happens in, uh, in, in one summer. And then we can you know, balance everything and make it a feature on the golf course. Yeah, there's no significant excavation or regrading. We're basically we're building it, right you know, right at grade, and then kind of, as you saw, the, the you know, kind of that lower right. uh, amenity level in the apartment, um, you know, is basically a walkout as the, as we get on the slope. Okay. And we are going to see that golf course plan, correct? Uh, Pardon me. Assuming that we're going to see that golf course plan in the future. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Or the renovation out there, we're going to. Of course. Yeah. yeah. I'm at the end of my list. Thank you. And by the way, I appreciate the, the changes that you've made on the building. Uh, um, uh, sometimes out of these meetings, uh, there's a lot of input, uh, comes a better plan. And I think you have a better plan today than you did when we came the first time. So appreciate the, the changes you've made and uh, the attention that uh, you played on, on some of the key key things. And the, the biggest thing for me is to make sure there's there's cooperation between the different parties here to make sure that uh, we deal with any issues that could impact the neighboring neighboring uh, property owners. Thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All righty. Um, I, too, would like to thank uh, everybody who has uh, spent countless hours from our staff to the presenting team. Um, but especially I want to thank all the residents who have been out here at two meetings and three or four last year. Um, I know it's been a burden for many of you to come out here and spend this many hours, um, and I appreciate your input. Um, I feel that uh, between last year's um, input and this year's, we've received a lot of great ideas, and many of these have come to fruition. Some of them have been disproved. Um, I know there's been a lot of discussion about stormwater. I've spent countless hours reviewing, and I've spent time with our village engineer privately going over all the stormwater. And it's pretty clear from a lot of the drawings that the stormwater moves away from a lot of the perimeter residential areas. Some of those, particularly at last month's meeting, there were many people who got up and talked about flooding in their areas right now. That obviously has nothing to do with the current building. There is no building. So there's problems to start with at some places. I don't think that this is going to make it worse because it's going to take water the other way in the other direction. And that's the way it's been designed, and that's the way it's going to go. And it's going to be enhanced another notch between now and final engineering, and it's going to go ahead and have several hands from different teams working together to go ahead and make sure that, uh, that it stays that way. I'm very appreciative of the fact that the Oak Grove and the preservation of the front nine is going to occur. I think those were... Um, I think those were no deal points, and uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that we got those taken care of, um, and uh, I think those are uh, very, very strong. I know that our parking is going to, uh, <clears throat> and uh, in the end, when the project is completed, there'll be plenty of parking. Um, I, I questioned a little bit about the traffic study, and I understand that there's been professional expertise added to that. Um, I spent some time in the south end of Westmont. We have a 399-unit building. And uh, that's about 100 units bigger than this. And uh, it's on a residential side street. And uh, I've been there in the mornings with a cup of coffee. And uh, I've never seen any problems or backups. And it's a four-way stop. Uh, so they don't even have a traffic light there. And there are a lot of buildings around that. Which leads me to say that we are certainly going to have more traffic. But as someone who lives immediately in that area and is at 35th and Cass every day, um, I've never had much of a problem getting in or out. In fact, I was disappointed. I'm sorry, Ms. Bushy. I was disappointed when the extra 35th Street light went in because I seem to always get stopped and sit at that one when there is no cross traffic. And uh, it irritates me to no end. But I understand that it's there. But anyway, that be as it may, uh, I also was very comfortable with some of the fire prevention as best as can be. There's no perfect solution. There's no perfect 
you know, we'd have no cars, we'd have no buildings, we'd have nothing if we were going to be in the perfect situation. But it sounds like that through the uh, coordination with our fire department, that all safety measures are going to be taken into account, and that's going to uh, provide a degree of safety um, for both the residents as well as for uh, the surrounding areas and communities. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and ask if there are any other comments from any of the other commissioners or any discussion or questions that any of you would like to ask now that you've heard the other commissioners speak. Is there any other, yes? Are there any other uh, comments from staff or from our village attorney? No. Hearing none, then I will go ahead and move to close the public hearing. And uh, we will begin to take a look at this and we will begin by taking a look at planning and zoning item 17-024, PHOBH Hotel Owner LLC and WCW Landowner LLC regarding the property located at 3500 Midwest Road in Oak Brook, Illinois for the following. A, a comprehensive plan amendment request to redesignate approximately 67 acres of open space to approximately 27 acres of general commercial and approximately 40 acres of single family detached residential. I will entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Bartell, second by Commissioner Thomas. Comments or discussion on the motion? Hearing none, roll call please. Commissioner Van Buren votes yes. Commissioner Thomas? Yes. Commissioner Bartell? Yes. Commissioner Lavoie? Yes. Commissioner Kymichael? Yes. Commissioner Sharp? Mr. Sharp recuses himself. And Chairman Pill? Yes. I will entertain a motion for item B, a map amendment request to rezone approximately 40 acres from B3 Special Business District to R1 Single Family Detached Residence District. So moved. And a second? Second. Motion by Commissioner Van Buren, second by Commissioner Thomas. Comments or discussion on the motion? Hearing none, roll call please. Commissioner Thomas? Yes. Commissioner Bartell? Yes. Commissioner Lavoy? Yes. Commissioner Carmichael? Yes. Commissioner Sharp? Recuse. Commissioner Van Buren votes yes and Chairman Pill? Yes. I will entertain a motion for item C, a text amendment request to amend various subsections of Appendix A, Section 7.06 of the Westmont Zoning Code regarding residential uses in the B3 Special Business District. So moved. Second. Second. Motion by Commissioner Bartell, second by Commissioner Carmichael. Comment or discussion on the motion? Roll call, please. Commissioner Bartell? Yes. Commissioner Lavoie? Yes. Commissioner Carmichael? Yes. Commissioner Sharp? Accused. Commissioner Van Buren votes yes. And Chairman Pill? Yes. I will entertain a motion for item D, a text amendment request to amend Appendix A, Article 11 of the Westmont Zoning Thank Code. You to permit electric, electronic message board signs in the B3 Special Business District. So moved. Second. Second. Before there's a vote on that, um, Commissioner Thomas did not, there was no roll call for his name on the last item. Oh, whose name? Commissioner Thomas, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I will not need to reread item D, but who uh, made the motion? Commissioner. Carmichael. Carmichael. Carmichael, okay. Second by me. And second by Commissioner Van Buren. Any comments or discussion on item D? Hearing none, roll call please. Commissioner Lavoie? Yes. Commissioner Carmichael? Yes. Commissioner Sharp? Yes. Commissioner Van Buren votes yes. Commissioner Thomas? Yes. Commissioner Bartell? Yes. Chairman Pill? Yes. Before we get to item D, we will require a reading of the findings of, excuse me, item E, a reading of the findings of fact. Um, this is PZ 17-024, PHOBH Hotel Owner LLC and WCW Land Owner LLC regarding 3500 Midwest Road, Oak Brook, Illinois. Request for a zoning ordinance map amendment to rezone approximately 27 acres from the B3 Special Business District to a planned development overlay lit district and the underlying B3 Special Business District 
to allow for the development of a 60,000 square foot natatorium, a residential apartment, apartment building and related improvements. Criteria number one, the proposed plan development achieves the following purposes of Article 9 of the Westmont Zoning Ordinance. A, encourages more creative design and development of land. B, promotes variety in the physical development pattern in the village. C, concentrates open space in more useful areas or preserves natural resources of the site. D, provides means for greater creat creativity and flexibility in environmental design than is provided under strict application of the requirements of the of other zoning districts, while at the same time preserving the health, safety, order, convenience, prosperity, and general welfare of the village of Westmont and its residents. E, allows flexibility and development of land as necessary to meet the changes in technology and demand what will be in the best interest of and consistent with the general intent of the comprehensive guide plan of the village. F, provides for the efficient allocation and maintenance by providing by private initiative of usable open space to all residential and commercial areas and to allow the most efficient use of public facilities and land in keeping with the best interests of the village. Findings of fact, by clustering the proposed apartment building and natatorium with the existing hotel, the applicant is able to preserve existing open space. The applicant will record a restrictive covenant or conservation easement to guarantee that the oak tree grove adjacent to the proposed apartment building will remain undisturbed and in perpetuity. The applicant will record a restrictive covenant over the front nine holes of the existing golf course to preserve this land for golf course or other active or passive recreational uses. This flexibility and creativity in design is consistent with the goals of <coughs> land development. The proposed project will provide enhanced landscaping, including the development of a berm with dense landscaping to screen the residential development to the east. The proposed project will include outdoor amenities for apartment building residents, including a swimming pool and walking path. These various open space, recreational, and landscape improvements will help achieve the stated purposes for the for planned developments. The variety and intensity of uses support the goals of the B3 Special Business District. The B3 Special Business District allows for a variety of uses and intensity of development in an area of increasing urbanization and of growing demand for these kind of land uses. The Natatorium provides a needed and unique recreational development which will serve the community and the greater Midwest region. The proposed apartment building will meet the market demand and will add occupant, occupants who will utilize and help sustain the adjacent golf course and other village restaurants and businesses. The proposed development will preserve the existing open space, will provide adequate means of ingress and egress, and will provide new recreational facilities and will not adversely affect the public or surrounding property owners. If you agree with these findings of fact, please raise your hand. If you disagree, raise your hand. And if you would like to recuse yourself. So we have six, zero, and one. I will entertain a motion for item E, map amendment request to rezone approximately 27 acres from B3 Special Business District to a planned development overlay district in the underlying B3 Special Business District. So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Bartel, second by Commissioner Thomas. Comments or discussion on the motion? Hearing none, roll call on item E, please. Commissioner Carmichael? Yes. Commissioner Sharp? Yes. Commissioner Van Buren votes yes. Commissioner Thomas? Yes. Commissioner Bartel? Yes. Commissioner Lavoie? Yes. And Chairman Pill? Yes. Prior to uh, calling for a motion on item F, we will have a, uh, another reading of the findings of fact, please. Once again, PZ 17-024, uh, PHWH Hotel Owner LLC and WCW Land Owner LLC regarding 3500 Midwest Road. Um, criteria number one, uh -oh, I'm sorry, let me back up. Request for a special use to allow residential dwelling units in the B3 Special Business District. Criteria number one, that the establishment, maintenance, or operation of the special use will not be detrimental to or endanger the public health, safety, morals, or comfort, or general welfare. Findings of fact, multifamily dwellings are common throughout the village and, in general, do not endanger the public health, safety, morals, or welfare. The proposed apartment building will be of high quality and will include higher and amenities such as an outdoor swimming pool, fitness center, office and meeting spaces, and walking jogging trail. Sufficient enclosed parking is provided to serve the occupants. As such, this proposed use will not be detrimental to or endanger the public health, safety, morals, or general welfare. 
Criterion number two, that the special use will not be injurious to the use and enjoyment of other property in the immediate vicinity for the purposes already permitted, nor substantially diminish or impair property values within the neighborhood. Findings of fact, the proposed apartment building will contain sufficient enclosed parking for the occupants. The residential development to the east is sufficiently set back from the proposed apartment building and will be partially screened by landscaping. Residential development to the west and to the north will be partially screened by the existing mature trees. Traffic from the apartment building will be sufficiently spread out throughout the day so as to not adversely impact, impact the public streets or the private drive on the property. Pedestrian and vehicular traffic from this development is not expected to encroach into the residential development to the east. The high-end apartment building should enhance the value of the property and should not adversely affect property values of surrounding properties. Criteria number three, that the establishment of the special use will not impede the normal and orderly development and improvement of the surrounding property for uses permitted in the district. Findings of fact, surrounding properties are fully developed and this development will not impede any future development of the surrounding area. Criteria number four, that adequate utilities, access ways, drainage and or other necessary facilities have been or are being provided. Findings of fact, the property is already serviced by adequ adequate utilities or utilities are otherwise readily available in the immediate area to serve the apartment building. The development will utilize an existing access road to and from Cass Avenue. The development will be engineered to meet DuPage County stormwater ordinance and village stormwater requirements. The project will prov provide adequate off-street parking facilities for its residents. Criteria number five, that adequate measures have been or will be taken to provide <coughs> ingress and egress so designed as to minimize traffic congestion in the public streets. Findings of fact, the property has sufficient means of ingress and egress onto Cass Avenue through a shared access drive. The access to and from Cass Avenue is controlled by an existing traffic signal. Traffic should be staggered throughout the day to minimize traffic congestion entering and exiting the development. The developer is installing a roundabout on the private drive to assist with tra traffic, traffic circulation. Criteria number six, that the special use shall in all other, all other respects conform to the applicable regulations of the district in which it is located, except as such regulations may in each instance be modified by the village board pursuant to the recommendation of the plan commission. Findings of fact, the development is consistent with the intensity of uses and the development contemplated for the B3 special business district. The apartment building complies with the all applicable bulk regulations and parking requirements. The only variance sought relates to the number of signs on the property. If you agree with these findings of fact, please raise your hand. If you disagree, raise your hand. If you recuse yourself, raise your hand. Six, zero, and one. I will entertain a motion for item F, a special use permit request to permit residential dwelling units in the B3 special business district. So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Bartell, second by Commissioner Thomas. Comment or discussion on the motion? Hearing none, roll call please. Commissioner Sharp. Recused. Commissioner Van Buren votes yes. Commissioner Thomas. Yes. Commissioner Bartell. Yes. Commissioner Lavoy. Yes. Commissioner Carmichael. Yes. Commissioner uh, Van Buren or no, Chairman Pill. Yes. Before we get to uh, item G, we'll need a reading of the findings of fact, and uh, I would just uh, tell staff that uh, these two were inverted in the uh, in the stapling, so it's the last page for this one. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Once again, it's PZ 17-024, PHOBH Hotel Owner LLC, and WCW Landowner LLC regarding 3500 Midwest Road. Request for a variance to increase the maximum number of signs permitted in the B3 Special Business District. Criteria number one, that the property in question cannot yield a reasonable return if permitted to be used only under the conditions allowed by the regulations in the district in which it is located. Findings of fact, the signage variance is requested for lot one, which contains the Hilton Hotel and associated parking. This lot currently has one wall sign on the hotel. Given the size of this lot, and in order to have an identification sign near the entrance point and various directional signs, the applicant seeks a variance. The applicant cannot adequately provide identification and directional signage on the single parcel while strictly adhering to the signage requirements of the zoning ordinance. The applicant cannot sufficiently inform the public of its various uses and yield a reasonable return without this variance. Criteria number two, the plight of the owner is due to unique circumstances. Findings of fact, given the setback of the hotel from the entry on Cass Avenue and given multiple uses as a part of this development, hotel, apartment, golf course, natatorium, 
The additional signage is necessary for informational purposes and to properly safe and safely direct traffic. Criteria number three, the variation if granted will not alter the essential character of the locality. Findings of fact, the property is zoned B3 Special Business District, which envisions a variety of intense commercial and residential uses. Given the pro proposed variety and intensity of uses for the property, the proposed signage is limited in number and size. The proposed signage is tasteful and consistent with signage for the existing hotel and resort. The proposed signs will not be visible to the residents to the east and will not alter the essential character of the area. If you agree with these findings of fact, please raise your hand. If you disagree with these findings, raise your hand. If you recuse yourself, please raise your hand. Six, O, oh, and one, please. I will entertain a motion for item G, a zoning code variance request to increase the maximum number of signs permitted in the B3 Special Business District. So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Carmichael, second by Commissioner Van Buren. Comments or questions on the motion? <coughs> Hearing none, roll call please. Commissioner Van Buren votes yes. Commissioner Thomas? Yes. Commissioner Bartell? Yes. Commissioner Lavoie? Yes. Commissioner Carmichael? Yes. And uh, Commissioner Sharp? Recused. And Chairman Pill? Yes. Before we uh, call for a motion for item H, we have a reading of the findings of fact, and then this one is three pages from the end. Mr. Chair. Um, once again, PZ 17 4 <coughs> PHOBH Hotel Owner LLC and WCW Land Owner LLC regarding 3500 Midwest Road. Request for a variance to reduce the number of required off street parking spaces required in the B3 Special Business District. Criteria number one the property in question cannot yield a reasonable return if permitted to be used only under the conditions allowed by the regulations in the district in which it is located. Findings of fact the applicant will ultimately provide off street parking spaces for the hotel use, the natatorium use, and the apartment use in excess of the requirements of the zoning ordinance. However, due to the development of this project in phases, with the natatorium construction proceeding before the apartment construction, this variance is necessary for the temporary shortfall of 102 parking spaces. Without this variance, the natatorium could not open for use until the apartment building and associated parking is complete. The applicant will provide cross-parking easements for the various uses. The applicant proposes to accommodate large-scale natatorium <coughs> events through off-site parking, the specifics of which will be addressed in a planned development agreement. The parking variance is necessary to allow the proposed intense development of the property while preserving open space. Without this variance, the applicant cannot yield a reasonable return and the proposed natatorium project is likely not feasible. Criteria number two, the plight of the owner is due to unique circumstances. Findings of fact, as stated above, the applicant will eventually provide the, uh, the excess off-street parking for all uses. However, in order to allow the natatorium to open prior to completion of the apartment building and associated parking, this variance is necessary. Criteria number three, the variation if granted will not alter the essential character of the locality. Findings of fact, the parking variance is expected to be of limited duration until the apartment building and associated parking is completed. Once completed, all parking for the apartment will be contained in a parking structure. This parking structure will serve as overflow parking for the hotel and natatorium. <coughs> the apartment building will wrap around the parking structure, making the, parking, the park structure not visible to surrounding properties. Parking for the hotel and natatorium will primarily be located on the existing surface lot. No new surface parking lots are proposed. The natatorium will provide valley parking and parking for large scale natatorium events will follow a parking plan as required by the plan development agreement between the applicant and the village. Ultimately, this cohesive development once complete will exceed the parking requirements of the zoning ordinance. It is not expected that the temporary parking shortfall will impact surrounding properties. The parking plan is consistent with the intensity of uses recommended for the B3 Special Business District. This parking variance will not alter the essential character of the area and is consistent with the existing intense parking for the hotel and golf course. Thank you. If you agree with these findings of fact, please raise your hand. If you disagree, please raise your hand. If you recuse yourself, six, zero, and one. I will entertain a motion for item G, a zoning code variance request to increase, excuse me, item H, a zoning code variance request to reduce the total required number of parking spaces in the B3 Special Business District. So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Van Buren, second by uh, Commissioner Carmichael. Comments or discussion on the motion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Commissioner Bartell? Yes. Commissioner Lavoie? 
Yes. Commissioner Carmichael? Yes. Commissioner Sharp? Accused. Commissioner Van Buren votes yes. Commissioner Thomas? Yes. And Chairman Pill? Yes. I will entertain a motion for item I, a preliminary concept plan approval for the new construction of an auditorium and a multifamily residential apartment building, including a phased site and landscaping plan. So moved. Second. Motion by uh, Commissioner Bartel, second by Commissioner Thomas. Comment or discussion on the motion? Hearing, <clears throat> pardon me? Hearing none, roll call please. Commissioner Lavoy? Yes. Commissioner Carmichael? Yes. Commissioner Sharp? Accused. Commissioner Van Buren votes yes. Commissioner Thomas? Yes. Commissioner Bartel? Yes. And Chairman Pill? Yes. I will entertain a motion for item J, preliminary plan of subdivision approval. So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Thomas, second by Commissioner Lavoy. Any comments or discussion on the motion? Hearing none, roll call please. Commissioner Michael, My, Carmichael? Yes. Commissioner Thomas? Yes. Commissioner Van Buren votes yes. Commissioner Thomas? I said yes before. Commissioner, yes. Commissioner Bartel? Yes. Commissioner Lavoy? Yes. And Chairman Pill? Yes. We have all of our T's crossed and our I's dotted. I hope so. Nice job there. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you to everyone and uh, thank you to, uh, to the HARP group. Uh, you have our recommendation, which will be forwarded on to the Village Board. And either Jill or Joe will contact with you with how the scheduling works as far as that's concerned. And uh, I guess my final comment on this would be, uh, I hope that uh, as we round out the final engineering and things, that there is a uh, teamwork approach to this amongst not only the staff, but uh, the other village folks and then some of our residents who have brought up some good comments over the last two sessions. Thank you all for being here. Uh, our meeting will be continuing right now, so I just ask you to either exit in quiet or to uh, continue and to be amazed by our wonderful group up here. Uh, Mr. Chair, one more, one more thing. I'd like to mention that the um, item will likely be scheduled for the December 21st Village Board meeting. Okay, so, so that agenda. just in case anybody missed that, this item is tentatively scheduled for December 21st for the Village Board. That will meet in this room, and I believe those are at 6 o'clock? 6 p.m., correct. 6 p.m. in this room on the 21st. Great. Um, do we have any miscellaneous items or anything uh, staff would like to bring up? Just that we want to wish everyone a happy holidays um, yeah. because I don't think we'll see each other before January. Um, we do have two items for the January meeting. Okay. And that January meeting will take place at 7 p.m. on uh, Wednesday, January 10th. Correct. I uh, look forward to seeing everyone there, and uh, please accept my wishes also for a Merry Christmas, a Happy Holiday, and a Happy New Year. Uh, I will call for a uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Bartel, second by Commissioner Thomas. All in favor? Aye. 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 This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>